The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, this hearing has a hard stop and will conclude at 1.30 p.m. This hearing is entitled Oversight of Prudential Regulators, Ensuring the Safety, Soundness, Diversity, and Accountability of Depository Institutions. I will now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome Vice Chair Barr, Acting Chairman Gruenberg, Chairman Harper, the Acting Comptroller, Sue, who are here to testify on their agency's regulation and supervision of our nation's financial institutions. I want to take a moment to congratulate uh, congratulate Acting Chairman Gruenberg on his nomination to serve as chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Throughout his years of dedicated public service, Chairman Gruenberg has promoted consumer protection, financial stability, and financial inclusion in the banking sector. And I look forward to the Senate promptly confirming him uh, to this key post. With that said, today's hearing is timely. Persistent inflation ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and Russia's war in Ukraine are all weighing heavily on our nation's economy and on the financial stability of America's workers, small businesses, and communities. Meanwhile, our financial system is rapidly evolving as banks and credit unions utilize new technologies to serve customers, while we also witness the real danger to customers when entities like cryptocurrency, exchange, FTX, operate in the shadows outside of robust federal oversight and clear rules of the road. This hearing continues this committee's oversight efforts to ensure that America's banking system is working for all people. I am pleased that during the Biden presidency, the agencies testifying before us have rejected a harmful Trump era rule to undermine the Community Reinvestment Act and jointly launched a new rulemaking to combat modern day redlining. In addition, they are taking steps to address climate related financial risk and considering ways to strengthen bank merger reviews that for far too long have been rubber stamped. Mergers in particular deserve strong scrutiny from regulators and I urge our panelists to give consumers, workers, and communities affected by mergers a real chance to share their concerns at public hearings. Moreover, any mergers that fail to serve the convenience and needs of affected communities or undermine financial stability should be thoroughly rejected. I look forward to hearing how our prudential regulators are working to promote diversity and inclusion in the banking system, including by supporting MDIs and CDFIs, which we know play a significant role in driving opportunities and resources to black communities that are often left behind by our nation's modern banking system. And importantly, I appreciate steps taken by our regulators to ensure banks are cautious and mindful of the risks posed by digital assets. I want to learn what else they're doing to monitor the impacts of emerging financial technologies and artificial intelligence in order to promote responsible innovation that protects consumers and whether they think Congress should pass legislation in the digital asset space, including legislation to regulate stable coins. There's much work to be done to protect consumers and strengthen the financial system for all. And so I'm eager to hear your testimonies today. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And first, I want to say thank you to the chair for scheduling uh, a hearing on FTX and its operations in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, we've coordinated uh, between the minority party and the majority party. Uh, to get this hearing on the books, and I look forward to working together to ensure that uh, the answers that customers, market participants, and, and the public deserve are actually answered. There is no sugarcoating it. The FTX collapse has been a dumpster fire. FTX users have been left out to dry. The digital asset ecosystem is in limbo. And add to the mix a Securities Exchange Commission chair who's more interested in chasing headlines 
than bad actors. And we're just starting to learn about the breadth and scope of what happened. We'll explore all of this at the upcoming hearing in December, but let me make this clear. Congress must develop a clear regulatory framework for the digital asset ecosystem, specifically trading platforms. That is the best way to protect American consumers from phonies posing as prodigies. Turning to today's hearing, I want to thank uh, our witnesses for being here. It's been almost 18 months since the four of you or your predecessors or anyone in your position have been before this committee. It's taken almost a year for someone to be confirmed as vice chair of supervision. Congratulations to you, Mr. Barr, on, on your uh, confirmation. Uh, one of you is still in an acting role with no nominee in sight. And another one of you is just renominated after serving on an expired term for nearly four years. That doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. As the Fed fights Democrat-induced inflation with its two available blunt instruments, raising rates and quantitative tightening, you and your agencies can and should be focused on safety and soundness in the current economic environment. At the same time, the housing sector and treasury markets are becoming areas of real concern. Liquidity in these markets, and specifically the role you all play in facilitating that liquidity, is something the new Republican majority will spend quite a bit of time unpacking. We want to make sure consumers are protected and our financial system is protected, yet also preserve economic growth. What worries me most is that instead of lessening the pain our constituents are feeling right now, you all are making the situation worse. Here are just a few examples. First, uh, Vice Chair Barr, over the last two years, our nation's banks have gone through a real life stress test and they prove their resiliency. Yet, you've suggested the capital framework should be revisited and revised in such a way that would harm banks' ability to promote economic growth and serve customers. Second, each of you has proposed changes to the Bank Merger Act, and this has had a chilling effect on the industry. That means less innovation and less competition in the marketplace. Acting Controller Sue, you've taken a posture with respect to third-party relationships that has had a negative impact on financial inclusion. Prior to your arrival, the OCC made significant progress in harnessing financial technology to reach the unbanked and underbanked. Now that progress has stalled. Today, we'll dig deeper into these and other concerns, but let me make this clear. This conversation isn't over. It's just beginning. Republicans are onto your playbook. We certainly are, and when you can't legislate, you regulate. And when you can't regulate, you pursue enforcement actions to grab headlines. I want us to make sure that we are focused on the American people, economic growth, cons consumer protection, financial security. Um, I think we can do that. I'm hopeful we can do that. Uh, and it will be the next Congress that will hold you accountable for these decisions. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from you in your opening statements. Thank you, Ranking Member McHenry. I now recognize the chairman of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, for one minute. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Gentlemen, good to see you all. Uh, thanks for your testimony today. I think uh, from my point of view, uh, we were talking a little bit about crypto, the chairwoman and the ranking member. Uh, we've seen a couple trillion dollars worth of perceived wealth kind of evaporate. We've seen a lot of wealth in the stock market uh, evaporate as we fight inflation, as you all uh, take steps to try to minimize inflation. We see inflation coming down. My concern will be on what happens next. Uh, where are we with uh, failures of businesses and foreclosures and those kinds of things that I could, we can expect to happen. And so I'm going to be interested to hear about that. I also am interested in your regulatory review of diversity and inclusion and environmental considerations, because those could be very important as we go forward. And I yield back to the chair. Thank you. <clears throat> I now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for one minute. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate all of you being here today. This year, the average U.S. household will spend an additional $5,200 because of inflation. The average 30-year mortgage is seven, over 7%. Seven the price of gas is still historically high, and practically every economist is predicting a recession. And what are the banking regulators doing about it? Within the past year, all the banking regulators have instructed financial institutions to monitor climate risk. That should help working people buy gas. The banking regulators have signaled the need for additional capital requirements, even though the Fed has stated, and I quote, banks continue to have strong capital levels, end quote. Not to mention banks just endured the real world stress test of COVID and passed with flying colors. Lastly, two of you, along with Director Chopra, colluded to force out former FDIC chair, proving to the American people that their ability to make ends meet is a distant second to your own personal and political ambitions. I look forward to discussing these issues with you today, and with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lukemeyer. I want to welcome today's distinguished witnesses to the committee. First, we have Michael Barr, who is the Vice Chairman of Supervision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Next, we have Martin Grutenberg, who is the Acting Chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Next, we have Todd Harper, who is the Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration. And finally, we have Michael So, who is the Acting Comptroller of the Currency of the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to present your oral testimony. You should be able to see a timer that will indicate how much time you have left. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer so that we can be respectful of everyone's time. Vice Chairman Barr, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Ranking Member McHenry and other members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Federal Reserve's supervisory and regulatory activities. As Vice Chair for Supervision, my priority is to make the banking system safer and fairer. The banking system is constantly evolving, so regulation and supervision must adjust to respond to new and emerging risks. Reforms following the global financial crisis have helped the United States maintain a resilient banking system for consumers, businesses, and communities. Capital and liquidity positions remain above regulatory requirements. But we must also ensure that we are keeping pace. Many issues at the forefront of banking regulation today were not prominent previously, and some of them scarcely even existed. Few anticipated a global pandemic. Recent events in crypto markets have highlighted the risks associated with new asset classes when not accompanied by strong guardrails. Turning to a number of our priorities at the Federal Reserve, I am taking a holistic look at the Fed's capital framework to assess whether it is functioning as intended and supports a resilient financial system. I believe the capital framework should be forward-looking, should be tiered so that the highest standards apply to the riskiest firms, and should support a safer and fairer financial system. In recent years, merger activity and organic growth have increased the size of large banks, which could complicate efforts by regulators to resolve those firms upon failure without disruption to customers and counterparties. The board and the FDIC recently invited comment on an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to enhance regulators' ability to resolve large banks in an orderly way should they fail. The Federal Reserve is also evaluating our approach to reviewing banks' proposed acquisitions. Mergers are often a feature of vibrant sectors, but the advantages that firms seek to gain through mergers must also be weighed against the risks that mergers can pose to competition, consumers, and financial stability. Another priority is monitoring the risk of crypto asset-related activities. Crypto asset-related activity requires effective oversight that includes safeguards to ensure that crypto companies are subject to similar regulatory safeguards as other financial services providers. We are also working to understand financial risks related to climate change. At the Fed, our mandate in this area is important, but narrow and we are focused on our supervisory responsibilities and our role in promoting a safe and stable financial system. To that end, the Federal Reserve recently announced a pilot climate scenario analysis exercise 
designed to enhance the ability of supervisors and firms to measure and manage climate-related financial risks. As the financial system continues to evolve, we must ensure that supervision and regulation keep up with these changes and are appropriate for the underlying risks. As Vice Chair for Supervision, I will continue to work to promote a safe and fair banking system. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman Barr. Next, we will go to Acting Chairman Gruenberg. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity today to uh, testify at this hearing on oversight of prudential regulators. In my oral remarks today, I'd like to focus on the state of the U.S. banking Excuse industry. me one moment. Would you speak directly into the microphone so you can be heard better? Yes. Is that better? Good. Thank you. In my oral remarks today, I'd like to focus on the state of the U.S. banking industry and the outlook for the industry. The banking industry has reported generally positive results this year amid continued economic uncertainty. Loan growth strengthened, net interest income grew, and most asset quality measures improved. And further, the industry remains well capitalized and highly liquid. The number of institutions on the FDIC's problem bank list remained stable in the second quarter of this year at 40 institutions. That's actually the lowest number uh, since the uh, quarterly reporting of that data began in 1986. 14 new banks opened through October of 2022, including the first mutual bank in 50 years. And additionally, no banks failed during 2021 and not this year either. At the same time, the banking industry reported a moderate decline in net income in the first two quarters of this year from a year ago, primarily because of an increase in provision expense at the largest institutions. This increase in provision expense, and it's worth paying some attention to, that's the amount set aside by institutions to protect against future credit losses, reflects the banking industry's recognition of risks related to persistent economic uncertainties and slowing economic growth, as well as the increase in loan balances. Rising market interest rates and strong loan growth supported an increase in the banking industry's net interest margin from the first to the second quarter of this year. Most banks reported higher net interest income compared with a, with a year ago as a result. However, Rising interest rates and longer asset maturities also resulted in unrealized losses on investment securities held by banks. As of the second quarter of 2022, banks reported $470 billion in unrealized losses as the market value of securities fell below their book value. And there's a real overhang here for the industry that we need to pay attention to. The FDIC expects this trend to be an ongoing challenge as interest rates continue to rise in the third quarter, especially if banks need to sell investments to meet liquidity needs. So in summary, despite several favorable performance metrics, the banking industry continues to face significant downside risks. These risks include the effects of inflation, rising market interest rates, slowing economic growth, and continued geopolitical uncertainty. Taken together, these risks may reduce profitability, weaken credit quality and capital, and limit loan growth in coming quarters. Further, as I mentioned, higher market interest rates have led to continued, continued growth and unrealized losses in the banking industry securities portfolios, and higher interest rates may also erode real estate and other asset values, as well as hamper borrowers' loan repayment ability. And these will all be matters of ongoing supervisory attention by the FDIC. In my written testimony, I provide an overview of the condition of the FDIC's deposit insurance fund and the reasons behind the FDIC's decision to increase deposit insurance assessments by two basis points next year 
in order to avoid a potentially larger, more pro-cyclical increase later at a less favorable point in the economic cycle. I also update the committee on five key policy priorities for the FDIC, strengthening the Community Reinvestment Act, addressing financial risks that are likely to affect banking organizations in the financial system as a result of climate change, reviewing the bank merger process, evaluating the risks of crypto assets to the banking system, and finalizing the Basel III capital rules. I also discussed the FDIC's efforts to support minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions, promote a diverse and inclusive workforce at the FDIC, strengthen cybersecurity within the banking industry and the FDIC's recent return to in-person examinations. I'll be glad to respond to questions from the committee on these or any other subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Chairman Gruenberg. Next, we will go to Chairman Harper. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the state of the credit union system. While the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, along with rising interest rates, have influenced credit union performance over the last year, the credit union industry remains on a strong footing. At the end of the second quarter, there were just under 5,000 federally insured credit unions with nearly 133 million members and more than $2.1 trillion in assets. Notably, the industry's aggregate net worth ratio rose to 10.42%, representing a recovery of 40 basis points from a pandemic low. Further, the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund continues to perform well with no premiums or distributions expected at this time. During the last year, the NCUA has undertaken several notable actions to strengthen capital, enhance cybersecurity, and support small and minority credit unions. To fortify the credit union system's ability to better withstand future crises, the NCUA implemented its risk-based capital rule along with a simplified compliance option at the start of 2022. The agency will also soon begin deployment of its new scalable information security examination program to allow the NCUA to better evaluate credit union cyber risks. Further, the agency has increased available resources in the field to assist small and minority credit unions. And we are working to modify our examination procedures for minority credit unions to better recognize their unique strategies. Additionally, the NCUA is paying closer attention to consumer financial protection, which buttresses and complements our safety and soundness efforts. This year, NCUA examiners are reviewing compliance with pandemic assistance programs, fair lending rules, service member protections, fair credit reporting rules, and overdraft programs. We have also increased resources for fair lending supervision. And as we move into 2023, the NCUA is emphasizing that all credit unions remain vigilant in managing safety and soundness and consumer financial protection to prepare for rising interest rates, inflationary pressures, liquidity concerns, and cybersecurity threats. Additionally, as the financial services system and credit unions continue to evolve, especially with many credit unions growing larger and more complex, the industry's regulatory framework must keep pace to maintain the strength and stability of the credit union system. In response to these changes and to legislation recently enacted into law, the NCUA has undertaken several rulemakings or implemented new rules during the last year. These rules address member expulsion procedures, subordinated debt, emergency capital investments, and cybersecurity notifications. Finally, I want to highlight two legislative changes that would help the agency better fulfill its statutory mission. Most timely, the NCUA requests a permanent adjustment to the agent member requirements for the central liquidity facility. Notably, the extension of this enhancement comes at no cost to the taxpayer as scored by the Congressional Budget Office. Currently, corporate credit unions may serve as an agent for a subset of their members, but three out of four credit unions including most minority credit unions, will lose access to an important liquidity backstop without legislative action by year's end. And the credit union system's capacity to address liquidity events 
will shrink by almost $10 billion. With growing interest rate risk and rising liquidity concerns, now is not the time to decrease access to the system's liquidity shock absorber. The NCOA is also seeking the restoration of its ability to oversee third-party vendors. This statutory change would provide the NCOA parity with other agencies that supervise and regulate federally insured depository institutions. This examination authority is critical given the system's increased reliance on third-party vendors and credit union service organizations. The Government Accountability Office, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and the NCUA's Office of Inspector General have all recommended that Congress restore the NCUA's vendor authority. The U.S. House of Representatives has also passed legislation as part of the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act to reinstate the NCUA's vendor authority. And in the Senate, bipartisan legislation has been introduced. I would like to thank the chairwoman in this committee for its continued support, as well as um, Subcommittee Chairman Foster for introducing 7022, the Strengthening Cybersecurity for Net Financial Sector Act. These bills would close a growing regulatory blind spot. That concludes my remarks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman Harper. Now we will go to our Acting Comptroller, Sue. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, I'm pleased to appear before you today to provide an update on the activities of the OCC. The mission of the OCC is to ensure that national banks and federal savings associations operate in a safe and sound manner, provide fair access to financial services, treat customers fairly, and comply with applicable laws and regulations. Since my appointment, to fulfill this mission, we have focused on four priorities, guarding against complacency, reducing inequality in banking, adapting to digitalization, and managing climate-related financial risks. My written statement describes the progress the OCC has made on each of these. Here, I would like to focus on how we are helping to ensure that banks serve the needs of their communities. First, I want to highlight the OCC's commitment to community banking. We are taking specific actions to support community banks, including revitalizing minority depository institutions, reducing community bank assessments, promoting de novo startup banks, and tailoring regulation based on size and complexity. Second, the OCC continues to encourage the banks we supervise to improve their products and services, including overdraft programs, with their, with their customers' financial health in mind. Many of these banks, including nearly all of the largest banks, have begun reforming their overdraft programs and lowering fees. While more work needs to be done, consumers are benefiting from the efforts of national banks to reduce penalty fees and the daily number of overdrafts charged, to provide grace periods before fees are imposed, and to end non-sufficient funds fees. By some estimates, changes at the largest national banks could save consumers billions of dollars annually. Additionally, the OCC has strengthened its supervision of compliance with fair lending laws. We recently updated our process for screening bank retail lending activities to provide more risk-focused fair lending examination strategy to identify weaknesses or wrongdoing. Where we find evidence of potential discrimination, we refer those matters to DOJ and HUD as applicable. Redlining and other forms of lending discrimination are unacceptable, especially in this day and age, and we will not hesitate to take enforcement action if necessary. The OCC, in coordination with the Federal Reserve, FDIC, as well as DOJ, is also considering updates to the framework for analyzing mergers under the Bank Merger Act. This is to ensure resulting entities continue to meet the convenience and needs of communities, support financial stability, enhance competition, and are safe and sound. The OCC considers each merger application on its merits against these statutory factors and associated regulatory criteria. We are planning a public symposium in February to explore this important issue further. As the digitalization of banking accelerates and bank fintech partnerships grow, the OCC is focused on ensuring that our expertise and regulatory framework adapts so that the safety and soundness and fairness of banking is maintained and even strengthened. We recently announced that we will be establishing an Office of Financial Technology early next year, building upon the work and successes of the agency's Office of Innovation, which was created in 2016. This change will enable us to engage more substantively with non-bank technology firms and to better supervise bank fintech partnerships so that we can help ensure that consumers of banking services are treated fairly, as well as help maintain a level playing field 
as the industry evolves. With regards to crypto, the OCC has adopted a careful and cautious approach. Last November, we issued guidance which reminds the banks we supervise that they are not permitted to engage in certain crypto activities unless they can perform these activities in a safe and sound manner. This approach helped to mitigate the risk of contagion from crypto to the federal banking system after the collapse of Terra Luna in the spring, as well as more recently with the bankruptcy of FTX. Finally, let me say a few words related to climate-related financial risks. The OCC's approach is firmly rooted in our mandate to ensure that national banks operate in a safe and sound manner. It is not our role to tell bankers who to bank and not to bank. We do not pick winners and losers. Rather, our focus is on risk management and making sure banks, especially large banks, have the necessary capabilities to identify, measure, and monitor their risks. We are committed to staying in our safety and soundness lane, not on setting industrial policy. This is important to our credibility as a safety and soundness supervisor. In closing, I remain committed to ensuring that OCC supervised banks operate in a safe, sound, and fair manner, meet the credit needs of their communities, and comply with applicable laws and regulations. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Vice Chair Barr, due to the recent failure of FTX, it is important now more than ever that Congress update our laws. And it's time for the regulators to update the rule book to strengthen protections for consumers and investors, as well as safeguards for our financial system from the risk of the digital assets ecosystem. The Fed signed onto several reports, including last year's President's Working Group, Stablecoins report, as well as a recent FSOP report that included all agencies represented on this panel, that urged Congress to enact legislation to address risk with digital assets, including stablecoins. You reaffirm this perspective in your testimony today. The Fed, along with others, have provided extensive feedback to me and Ranking Member McHenry to how best to design a federal framework for payment stable coins. For the record, do you support the overall approach we have outlined? Where would you draw the line distinguishing between federal and state oversight of payment stable coins? Are there areas of the approach that need to be strengthened in light of the failure of FTX? Is this an area where Congress can afford to wait and hope no other crypto failures happen that harm innocent consumers and investors? Or is there urgency to enact legislation without delay? Thank you, uh, Chair Waters. I was uh, deeply encouraged by the uh, bipartisan legislation that that you and Ranking Member McHenry uh, have been working on together. Uh, I think this is, a, is an urgent area uh, for us to continue to work on. Uh, stable coins are, are obviously not uh, the whole of the system, but stable coins present an important and, and urgent risk for us uh, to address. Uh, stable coins are, in effect, a, a form of private money. Uh, and we've seen in history that uh, private money uh, can generate significant run risks and financial stability risks if not uh, uh, strongly and appropriately regulated. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we have uh, stablecoin legislation that recognizes that. You know, as, as Chair Powell said uh, recently, uh, stablecoins uh, really, uh, that, that are backed by the dollar, really borrow the trust uh, of the Federal Reserve. They borrow the trust of the public. And so it's critical that we have appropriate controls. We have a federal, strong federal oversight of approval of stable coins, supervision uh, regula and regulation of stable coins. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Acting Controller Sue. I understand the recent failure of FTX may have affected a couple of banks with some exposure to the failed crypto exchange. But the vast majority of banks do not appear to be affected, apparently due to steps the OCC and others have taken to ensure that the banks conduct the appropriate, appropriate due diligence and risk management before engaging with digital assets. However, more needs to be done. 
The recent failure of FTX appears to funds to its affiliated proprietary trading from Alameda. These customers now have to wait for years as bankruptcy proceedings progress to possibly see any of their assets re return. When it comes to the custody of consumer funds, do you think that a digital asset wallet or other entity should be allowed to commingle its funds with the assets of its customers? If such assets are, con are commingled, does that allow for the wallet or exchange to lend out its customer assets for other purposes? No. I think commingling of customer funds with house funds in general has over time proven to be uh, very difficult to risk manage. So the way we've approached this at the OCC, the way we think about this, first and foremost, any crypto activity done in the national banking system needs to be safe, sound, and fair. That is absolutely critical. Second, we want to make sure that customers and consumers are protected. And third, we need to ensure financial stability. So by taking this approach that we've taken, it's helped to mitigate the risk of cross-contagion in crypto into banking. Within crypto, the commingling has been something that I have highlighted. It's something that in the traditional financial system where we have laws and regs, there are really strong rules uh, that account for that to ensure that, that those things don't happen. So I think it'd be uh, good to apply those in other spaces as well, including crypto. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is a ranking member of the committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, you mentioned earlier this fall you'd be conducting a holistic review of the capital framework to make the financial system safer. I mentioned that in my opening statement. Um, to, uh, yesterday, the Financial Times um, highlighted concerns that regulation introduced after the financial crisis have impacted the Treasury's market. Um, and I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the Financial Times article entitled The Cracks in the U.S. Treasury Bond Market into the record. Um, so my question to you is, um, would you agree that um, increased capital requirements on banks, like the supplemental leverage ratio, ultimately have impacted their ability to provide liquidity in the Treasury's marketplace? Um, I, you know, I, well, let me just step back. There are concerns about the Treasury marketplace, uh, the, uh, the Treasury market. Are those valid concerns? What are you doing to address them? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member uh, McHenry. Uh, I'm uh, quite attentive to uh, the concerns about the liquidity in the Treasury market. Uh, the Treasury market uh, is experiencing higher levels of volatility. Um, that's true of a number of other uh, markets uh, right now. We're paying attention to the volatility in those markets, and that, that volatility uh, leads to lower levels of uh, liquidity, which we're also seeing in, in the Treasury and other markets. Uh, we're, we're paying attention to those issues. The, the reason for them is multifaceted. Uh, we're examining those reasons as part of a broader interagency review of resilience in the Treasury markets. And we've taken some steps already to think about the resilience of that market. So for example, uh, the Federal Reserve has put in place a, a backstop facility uh, for repo transactions uh, and a backstop facility for foreign official uh, repo transactions. And those facilities are designed uh, to help mitigate stress in the market we're also looking at- uh, But on that, the, on that, that is setting up a Fed facility to facilitate something that should be a well-functioning, highly liquid market that is of $25 trillion of notional value. So for the Fed to step in there, let's just say that's probably not in the broader global marketplace interest for the Fed to have to step in like that. So what are you gonna do, what are you doing to address private sector ability provide liquidity using the Treasury's market. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I was describing the, the various steps that, that have been taken. As part of that overall review that you mentioned before, we are looking at the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio and other capital requirements and seeing how they work together. Uh, other agencies are also looking at uh, other elements of the package. The, the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, has made a set of proposals with respect to uh, oversight of trading firms that are not currently regulated as dealers, but are significant participants 
in the market for Treasury securities and is also looking at central clearing with respect to Treasury securities. I understand. That's, as a it, whole, are part I'm of I'm asking what, how you're doing, what you're doing to approach this. Uh, and I understand the, the, po the public comments from the Securities Exchange Commission on their, their two proposals. Um, but you have a large remit to address capital standards. Um, and do you believe that those capital standards have some bearing in liquidity in the marketplace, in the Treasury marketplace? We're, we're examining that issue. I think if you, if you kind of rank order the list of reasons for Treasury market um, liquidity constraints right now, it's relatively low on that list. It's probably on the list, but relatively low on the list. And so we're looking at the uh, capital framework uh, with, that, with that in mind. Well, as we saw with the UK gilt market, uh, when uh, the bank, the central bank, uh, had to step in to prop up that market, it had a negative impact, a broadly negative impact. Uh, we do not want to see that in our Treasury's market. And it's my hope that you can address this before we have some unfortunate event uh, that could have severe consequences. As I said, we are quite attentive to liquidity issues in the Treasury market, and we're exploring the full range of tools uh, to, to make sure that the Treasury market And you're doing everything in your power to address that? We are. We're looking at the full range of tools to make sure the Treasury market is resilient. And as Vice Chair for Regulation, we look to you for a plan going forward, and we hope you'll make that a transparent process uh, for those of us in, in this branch of government. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for convening this important hearing on the oversight of prudential regulators. Uh, I want to build on the bipartisan work of this committee in 2009 when we passed the CARD Act, the Credit Cardholders Bill of Rights, uh, according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, this bill alone saves consumers over $16 billion a year. I have introduced the overdraft bill, which would build on, on that uh, work. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has found that overdraft fees cost uh, consumers over $15 billion, $15 billion, in 2019 alone, and that these fees disproportionately target and penalize low-income uh, consumers. Uh, while I'm very glad to see that some banks have taken some initiative by eliminating these fees or moving in that direction, it's concerning to me that it's taken this long, <laughs> it's piecemeal, and that many banks still have yet to make any voluntary changes. And I think there should be a uniform standard. That's why I have introduced the Overdraft Protection Act, which would crack down on predatory overdraft fees and would establish fair and transparent practices for overdraft coverage programs. This legislation passed out of our committee in July. And as I said, bills on the credit card bill of rights. Mr. Grunberg, in 2010, when you were vice chair of the FDIC, the FDIC issued supervisory guidance on overdraft fees. In your opinion, how has the practice of overdraft fees changed over time? Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, uh, as you indicate, uh, um, this is uh, an issue that's gained a lot of attention. I think the banking industry has become increasingly attentive to it and there's been some progress made, as you indicated, in terms of institutions um, uh, reducing reliance on overdraft fees. I think from the FDIC's perspective, uh, the critical thing is uh, in our examination process to ensure that banks that utilize overdraft fees are doing it in a transparent way, that consumers are fully informed, and that banks are complying with all regulatory requirements, including the fact that Consumers have to affirmatively opt in to choose overdraft coverage. And we, we have had issues that we've identified <laughs> with overdraft and insufficient fund fees uh, where uh, institutions may not be giving adequate disclosure to ensure that consumers simply understand uh, the fees that they're being charged. And in some cases, we have, we have taken action in regard to it. 
I think you're on uh, that. From, from your vantage point, are there instances where the FDIC might classify certain overdraft programs, such as those that reorder the sequence in which transactions are processed to maximize the overdraft fee revenue for the bank to the detriment of the consumer as an unsafe or unsound banking practice? Uh, that is, depending on how the practice is implemented, uh, that, that is a possibility. Far, obviously the explosion of the crypto platform form FTX has been in the news and from your and the Fed's vantage point, do these events have an impact uh, to our regulated financial system and the safety and soundness of our banking system? Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, to date, the recent crypto events um, have had some impact in the banking system, but it's been in an aggregate level relatively uh, muted. Uh, the banking system has, in general, been cautious about uh, the connections between banking and, and crypto-related activity. There are some banks that are providing traditional banking services uh, to the crypto sector, uh, and so we're attentive to, to the risk that that might pose. Uh, but from a systemic level, we're not seeing currently a systemic risk um, from the crypto-related activity. Of course, it, it had a devastating effect on uh, the individuals uh, affected, the consumers, and and investors in that space, and 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 that is uh, uh, really a, a, a difficult problem. Well, what's your view of exposing our financial system to such volatile products that uh, uh, can, as you said, uh, hurt consumers so considerably as they just did? We we need to be um, uh, cautious and put in place appropriate guardrails so that. Uh, if banks are engaged in crypto-related activities, those are done in a, in a safe and sound manner and in a manner consistent with protecting consumers and investors. Do you think crypto should be regulated? Uh, yes, I think that uh, regulators should use their existing authorities uh, uh, to do so. And if, if Congress steps in in this space, it's important that it strengthen the uh, oversight of this sector. Thank you. All right, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Vice Chair Barr, let me try this from a different angle. The U.S. Treasury market is the biggest, deepest, and most important bond market in the world. Historically, the stability and liquidity of treasuries have made them a safe haven for investors during market crises and um, a common benchmark for other fixed income securities and even hedging positions. As a result, treasury market conditions impact borrowing costs for consumers, businesses, and governments across the globe. Given the significance of this market to the global financial system, the primary goal of reform should be to enhance liquidity, capacity, and resilience, and to meet the growing demand for and supply of Treasury securities during all stages of the market cycle. The SEC recently issued a rule proposal that would impose new requirements on clearing agencies. And in June, the Treasury Department solicited proposals to create additional disclosures in the Treasury market. In a recent speech, your colleague, Governor Bowman, explained that the flood of reserves within the banking systems have hampered the distribution of capital. This increase in reserves can disrupt markets and distort incentives to provide credit and thus lend to consumers and businesses. Sir, do you agree with Governor Bowman that addressing these issues with leverage ratios could improve market functioning and financial stability? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, the Treasury market is a, a robust and resilient market. It is a market that... Yes, we've outlined welcomes. that. What, do you agree with Governor Bowman or not? 
I, I haven't read Governor Bowman's remarks. I'm trying to give you a sense of what I think about the issue, and that, that is that the Treasury market is resilient and robust. In the, in the current uh, uh, environment right now, we are seeing volatility in that market and in other markets like the corporate bond market that is uh, elevated. And together with that higher volatility as expected, liquidity is lower in that. That is primarily driven by the economic circumstances that we're in. We're coming out of a period uh, in which we experienced a, a rapid decline. Okay, could, of, could you just cut to the chase here, please, uh, um, Vice Chair uh, Barr, and, and explain any of, the, any of the progress to date inside the Fed to develop a proposal towards this end, to deal with this situation, and, and the differences among Fed governors. I, I'm not aware of, uh, of differences, but I, I will say that the Treasury market uh, reform effort that I described earlier is a broad-based effort that includes the Federal Reserve and other agencies. And inside the Fed, we've already taken steps with respect to the resilience of the market in establishing an affordable But the SEC is knocking that back with their, with their proposals. The, the, the SEC, I think you'd, you'd want to address questions about the SEC to the SEC, but with respect to our proposals, uh, I believe that we've made progress in improving the resilience okay. of the Treasury market and are continuing to make progress. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to move on. Vice Chair Barr, uh, Chairman Powell has said that capital in the largest banks is at multi-decade highs. Secretary Yellen has said quote, regulation of financial institutions has been markedly strengthened. And that when the pandemic struck, that the core of our financial system did very well because of the improvements in capital liquidity and risk management and stress testing. Do you believe that increased capital requirements negatively affect banks' ability to provide credit to consumers and businesses? Uh, thank you. Uh, no, uh, uh, capital is essential for uh, uh, financial institutions to be able to offer uh, loans to consumers and businesses. We have a strong banking system in the United States because, in part, we have, together with financial sector innovation, a strong regulatory framework, including strong capital requirements. Do you, do so you that believe that our capital enables, levels are strong enough right now? Well, as I um, said in my opening remarks, I'm conducting a holistic review of the holistic capital review. framework right now to make that a kind of assessment. Okay, I, I have uh, questions, Madam Chair, for uh, Chair Grunberg, but I will go ahead and submit those to the record. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is now, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Business, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, I heard what you just said to Mrs. Maloney about FTX's collapse and using your existing regulatory authority to impose guardrails and urge caution. Uh, what guardrails are you considering using your existing authority? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, obviously, the recent uh, collapse um, is largely occurring uh, outside the regulatory perimeter of the banking uh, regulators. Mm -hmm. It's really a question for market regulators. The, the exposure to banks itself has been, in the aggregate, muted. As, as I mentioned, there are some uh, number of banks offering traditional banking services to the crypto sector, and as always, we're monitoring that kind of activity. Within banking, we need clear guardrails so that uh, banks know what is uh, activity is permissible and so that they can conduct that activity in a safe and sound manner. And I think it's really important for us to be um, regulating the same kind of risk in the same way, regardless of, of how it's conducted. So you think that additional legislation uh, from Congress will be helpful? I, I do. I think particularly in the area of stable coins, uh, that it would be important for Congress to step in and say, you're not permitted to offer a stable coin unless it's done under a strong prudential framework with Federal Reserve oversight, supervision, regulation, and approval, uh, because private money can create enormous financial stability risks unless it's appropriately regulated. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Barr, the FSOC 2021 annual report highlights financial institutions' rapid utilization of emerging technologies like cloud computing 
According to one recent industry survey, 94% of banking executives project that 50% or more of their organization's business will be on the cloud within three years. How does the banking industry's increasing reliance on cloud storage change this sector's risk profile? Uh, thank you. I, I do think the issue of uh, bank reliance on, on the cloud um, over time is one that we're going to have to spend uh, increasing attention to. Uh, right now, it has been, uh, again, in the aggregate, a relatively small part of the way that banks um, engage, but uh, it will likely grow over time. And as it grows, uh, we need to be sure that we're uh, supervising and regulating banks in such a way that they are monitoring those risks and paying attention to those risks, and that we're thinking about uh, the third-party providers in that framework as so, well. So how does this change the Fed's approach to regulation and supervision of financial institutions? Well, we, we're always attentive to third-party relationships and the extent to which banks rely on third parties, uh, to, especially with respect to safety and soundness, but also consumer compliance issues. And so we supervise the regulated institutions, and we have an ability to get access to records and materials we need with respect to that supervision from third-party service providers. And that, that is also true of the cloud, that, that, that to the extent that banks are relying on the cloud, we need to have access to the data and information we need to make good judgments about the sound risk management practices of the banks using those services. Thank you. Acting Chairman Grunberg, <laughs> according to the FDIC's uh, 2021 National Survey of unbank and underbank households, unbank households were not as likely to use online payment companies as bank households but they were more likely to use the company, this company for services they otherwise use a bank account for, like paying bills, receiving income, or sa saving their money. In your estimation, what do these trends tell you? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Or tell us. Uh, yes, thank you for that question. And it was an important insight from the survey. And the survey found that, that both banked households and unbanked household Households utilized the payment services, but they utilized them in different ways. For banked households, they were usually used to supplement the services of their bank accounts to make uh, payments to a, a, a particular party, but were not utilized for basic banking services in terms of holding accounts and making handling their core financial service needs. For the unbanked, the finding was that they were using these payment services effectively as an alternative to banking services, and the costs of doing so generally tend to be higher for those households. And it underscored the value of trying to expand access to the mainstream banking system for those households so they could benefit both from the security and in, and in cases from the lower costs of utilizing insured financial institutions. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it is good to be here with our panelists today. Any of you who have been around me know that I'm very focused on how your decisions and actions impact the economy in my great state. Because I always believe that what's good for Oklahoma is certainly good for the nation, and for that matter, the world economy. So that said, Oklahoma is a commodity-driven economy centered on agricultural products such as cattle and wheat and energy like oil and gas and wind. These industries are capital intensive. So the actions of the prudential regulators have a substantial impact on my district. Calls to enlist the financial regulators in efforts to steer the flow of capital away from businesses based on uh, political objectives would distort markets and have severe, long-lasting economic consequences. So my first question is to Vice uh, Chair Barr. The Fed recently announced a climate scenario analysis pilot for the nation's largest banks. Could you outline the climate-related information the Fed is gathering from these firms? And is there any outcome of this analysis that could lead to capital requirements or supervisory implications? 
think, think you know where I'm coming from. Thank you, Representative Lucas. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve's role in this area is, is an important role, but it's a very narrow role. Uh, and that's to look at financial risk management at firms with respect to, to climate issues. The pilot scenario analysis we're doing uh, doesn't have supervisory implications. It doesn't have capital implications. It's designed to really understand that risk management approach. And I would just add, I, I, I very much agree with you. I don't think it's the business of uh, the Federal Reserve uh, to tell firms who to lend to or who not to lend to uh, with respect to to these issues, and you will not see us doing that. Thank you. Continuing on that thought, Acting Comptroller Sue, last year the OCC joined the Fed as a member of the Network for Greening the Financial System. A goal of the network is to, quote, mobilize mainstream finance to support the transition towards a sustainable economy, unquote. Do you agree that U.S. regulators should align with this stated goal of the network to mobilize finance or climate policy goals, and what do you see the OCC's role in regulating climate change? So our role is firmly rooted and focused on safety and soundness, which means focusing on the risk management aspects of climate risk management. Uh, I agree to echo uh, what Vice Chair Barr said. You're gonna stay in our safety and soundness lane, that's very important. Um, and maybe to quickly follow up on that, I've heard a lot from community banks in particular, some of the concerns that you have highlighted um, in terms of concerns about climate risk management policies impacting and kind of flowing through uh, bank regulators. Uh, I went out and visited uh, banks and uh, producers in Midland, Texas, in Lubbock, uh, in uh, Topeka, Kansas, talked to the Kansas Bankers Association, Iowa Bankers Association, others who have conveyed very similar concerns. We're taking that all into account. Our focus has been on large banks. They're really focused on the largest banks. We issued principles, focused on banks that are $100 billion and above, and that's where we're gonna maintain our focus for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Acting Chairman Greenberg, as Chairman of the Resolution Steering Group for the Financial Stability Board, I understand you're working in coordination with global financial authorities to lessen the impact of market volatility on financial stability. From my time as Ag Committee Chairman during the Dodd-Frank implementation, I understand how important close coordination between the prudential regulators and the other market regulators is. As it relates to the resiliency of the central counterparty clearing houses, what should financial authorities be focused on? And have you engaged with the CFTC and the SEC given their oversight roles? Uh, thank you very much for that question, uh, Congressman. Uh, the answer is yes in terms of our a coordination with the SEC and the CFTC and the Federal Reserve around this issue of central clearing counterparties. As you know, um, CCPs, as they're called, um, had a systemic footprint before the 2008 global financial crisis. And one of the reforms after the crisis was to mandate clearing of derivatives, and that even expanded their footprint so from a financial stability standpoint, the supervision of CCPs is really a critical priority, and you cannot discount the possibility that a CCP could get into financial difficulty and even fail. So you need a capacity both to strengthen the supervision and to have the capability to manage an orderly failure, and that's what we've been focusing on. As I yield back, Madam Chair, I would simply note I think these are all issues we are going to dwell a great deal on next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. For a better part of a decade, I've called for a ban on cryptocurrencies and prohibiting Americans from buying them. The crypto bros, the crypto billionaire bros, are now desperate for the patina of regulation as they continue to try to build a system that will allow them to make more trillions while facilitating tax evasion and sanctions evasion. They want regulation. No, they want the appearance of regulation. Their goal is to undermine the SEC. The SEC has not been perfect. Just in this room in July, I uh, demanded uh, that the SEC, uh, talking to their chief enforcement officer, crack down on the crypto exchanges. 
A few months later, we saw the collapse of the FTX crypto exchange. Uh, they are, but in any way, the, the crypto billionaire bros are determined to get a light regulator. And I'm distressed by what I've heard from you, gentlemen. Guardrails, safe and sound ways to deal with crypto. You sound like Sam Bankman Freed, only you're wearing long pants instead of shorts. Um, what vague pablum. In Basel, they have proposed tough, real standards, not vague pablum. Please raise your hand if you're willing to commit to standards at least as tough for crypto as those published in Basel. Thank you. All the hands went up. That's the best answer I've gotten in a long time. Um, because you, I see real businesses in my district that provide real products, that provide working class jobs turned down by the folks you regulate. And I'm told, well, we need that to preserve the banking system. And then I see banks investing in crypto, not to a huge scale yet, and I'm uh, uh, hopeful that with a, uh, a system that regards that as basically a worthless asset uh, for capital purposes uh, that will at least protect the banking system from this pernicious uh, uh, effort. Um, uh, the uh, FT, uh, we've seen over a uh, billion dollars of consumer losses just in six months by people uh, impersonating uh, FDIC employees, and I hope very much that you'll be working to prevent that. And uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, Barr, uh, for years I've been pressing the Fed to have a system of wiring funds that is safe from the hackers who get you, con you into wiring your funds. Usually the deposit to buy that first house gets wired to a prince in Nigeria because, because you identify, you wire it to a number, but not a name. And, and uh, the Fed has basically, while the UK prevents this effectively by having the payee identified in the wire, the Fed consistently refuses to do that. I've given up on getting you to do the right thing. The one thing I want you and your fellow board members to do is to meet with the people who lost their dream of ever owning a house when they wired their money to the wrong and that uh, to the wrong account uh, that uh, some number they got from uh, 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 from, from an email. Um, but uh, Mr. Barr, um, yesterday uh, Senator Ossoff uh, asked you whether you were concerned about the liquidity of the Treasury market. I believe the woman from Missouri brought this up. Uh, you were watching it. Uh, you said you were watching it closely. Secretary Yellen said she was concerned. Uh, we saw a liquidity in the Treasury markets at the start of the pandemic, and of course the Fed took action at that time. Is there thought being given to adjust leverage requirements to help uh, incentivize uh, more intermediation in the Treasury market? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, we're looking at uh, a wide range of measures with respect to the resiliency of the Treasury markets. As I said, the Treasury market is resilient and robust. We are seeing higher levels of volatility in that market currently, and, and therefore lower levels of, uh, of, volat of uh, liquidity. And, and we're looking at the range of reasons for that, including uh, looking at um, uh, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio. We're looking, uh, as uh, I described earlier, we're, we've set up backstop facilities in the event there's significant stress in the market. And, and this is part of a larger set of reforms that the Treasury and other agencies are undertaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is now recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. And to our uh, witnesses who are here today, thank you so much for uh, being in front of us and allowing uh, on both sides to uh, ask questions that we that we have and and I appreciate you being here uh, Vice Chairman Barr we provided you at about the time perhaps you arrived today a question that I was going to ask you 
And we were told by the person who was uh, accepting that, that perhaps you may or may not be available with the question at hand, but I wanna ask it anyway, and I hope you've got the sheet of paper in front of you. I have the honor to represent uh, the Chairman Rusty Rust from the Texas Bankers Association. It's a large group of bankers all across Texas, and so Mr. Rust is chairman, as, as the chairman sees issues and hears issues from banks. I know you're in the field. I know you hear uh, feedback about the things that the uh, bankers hear and see, but specifically, a regulatory CC requires that a depository bank make funds deposited in an account by a cashier's check available for withdrawal not later than the business day after the banking day on which the funds were deposited. We get this because theoretically a cashier's check is a guarantee. Well, that's not true anymore. The problem is that a seven-day hold on cashier's checks are available only for amounts over $5,525, which means that those who would wish to take advantage of this abound, at least in some marketplaces. It is not unusual for a bank in Texas to receive a cashier's check from outside the state of Texas. There's a lot of activity going on. But when this bank receives that cashier's check, they are required at amounts lower than $5,525. They are required to literally, after one day, to make the money available. This has become an open issue because when that person accepting the check suggests that it might not be real, they have to go through some due diligence on their own rather quickly to figure out where it came from. I cannot tell you, I can't in my own business, but their experience teaches them this may not be true. Perhaps they go online, perhaps they look up the bank, perhaps they can't find it, perhaps there's not a number available for them to verify it. So they are required to cash that cashier's check. I'm interested in, you don't have to answer it right now, but I'm interested in your opinion of this. I'm interested in what you believe uh, the Board of Governors should be aware of that this is a problem and how we might go about rapidly, not over some rulemaking procedures, but to address the issue, and so I will be sending you a letter to your office with this exact specification that I've talked about and look forward to your answer. And I appreciate you. If you'd like to, to, to respond, we've got a, a minute. I cannot hear you, sir. I apologize. Is that better? Now yes, that I've sir. turned on my mic. Um, I, I'm happy to take a, a, a more careful look at it. Just at, you know, at, at a very high level, uh, of course, we're concerned uh, whenever there's fraud in, in any payment system, and, and so I appreciate your bringing this issue to our attention. The, the Expedited Funds Availability Act sets out rules for the timing of uh, uh, payment on cashier's checks, and Reg CC follows that act, so we'd have to at, you know, look at that with that in mind. But, but broadly speaking, obviously, we, we care deeply about whether there's any fraud in the payment system, and I'm happy to, to take a more careful look at it. Well, I, th I think the point, if I were listening to our chairman, Rusty Rust, from the Texas Bankers Association, he wants a to be able to use their experience so that they avoid this because it is occurring on a regular basis, and so I intend to engage you. I want to thank you for your attention to this matter as it is an issue, and I thank the young chairwoman for giving me the time. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, who is also the chair of the House Agriculture Committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady. As each of you know, the Federal Housing Finance Agency's policy on tangible 
capital limits access to federal home loan bank advances to banks that have negative tangible book value. And even though these banks are already considered to be well capitalized by each of your four regulatory agency. But my uh, growing concern is that this is a inconsistency and it threatens to transform a short-term market issue into a potentially serious problem. Now I understand that the FHFA uh, can issue an interim rule to bring its Intent, uh, its tangible capital rules policy closer in line with other regulators. But I'm more interested in learning about what each of you four has done, can do, or will do to avoid turning what is unrealized net losses into uh, a real supervisory issue that will disproportionately impact our community banks. Uh, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, our community banks truly are really the heart and soul of our financial system, particularly in all the variety of things that they do for such a variety of different communities. And I'm learning, uh, I'm interested in learning about what each of you can do to help with this situation. First to you, Mr. Barr, and then to Mr. Groomberg, do you acknowledge that this in, is in fact an issue? And if you do, what steps are you taking to ensure that investments made by community banks in U.S. treasuries that may have resulted in unrealized losses do not become a supervisory crisis. Mr. Barr, Mr. Groom, I will start with you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Scott. Uh, we very much uh, understand that this is a, an issue that a number of um, uh, organizations and, and uh, entities representing community banks have, have come to us about this issue. And as you said, community banks really are the lifeblood of, uh, of local communities. So we want to make sure that community banks are, are thriving. Uh, as, as you pointed out in your remarks, the FHFA in the first instance has the authority to say what is safe and sound for the federal home loan bank systems to do when it's safe for them to lend. Our job is really as supervisors to focus on the safety and soundness of individual these individual banks. And so as part of the supervisory process, we, we of course look at our capital rules, and our capital rules for community banks uh, do not include the concept of including these unrealized losses in their capital ratios. Uh, so we, we do look at what it means for them in terms of how they're managing their interest rate risk Thank you. How they're managing for, their, their liquidity. Thank rates. you so much for that. I appreciate it, Mr. Gomberg. I'm sorry. But you may be able to get to this. But I got you four here. You guys uh, can really help us with this. I'm very concerned about this, and I want to help resolve this issue facing our community banks. So if each one of you would say yes or no to this question, uh, first question, are your institutions currently working on putting any kind of regulatory process in place so that a community bank can seek a waiver from the Federal Housing Finance Agency's tangible capital rule? Just say yes or no, quickly. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Barn, and quick. I got 15 seconds, and I got another question. Go ahead, just say yes or no. <laughs> the the circumstances of each individual community yeah, bank. Yes or no, fact. please. I, she's gonna. There you go. I, I, Congressman, would you? I, yeah, please. I can answer. Better. 
If the issue is a blanket waiver, I think the answer would be no, because each individual institution has its own profile. I will say we are working with the institutions and the FHFA, and I think we agree with you that there is a significant underlying risk management issue relating to the unrealized losses on the balance sheets of the bank. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Lane. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Prudential Regulators uh, for taking time to testify before us today. Uh, Mr. Sue, the last time Director Chopra appeared before the Senate in April, he testified that both the general counsels and legal advisors at CFPB and OCC drafted a memorandum to analyze the FDIC board's uh, bylaws. However, the next day in front of this committee, I pressed Director Chopra on this issue, and his response was, ask the OCC. Well, we did just that. We sent you a formal letter uh, inquiring about the OCC's involvement in creating this memo. In April of this year, you responded to that, and I quote, the, the OCC's legal staff did not assist the CFPB with any drafting review of an opinion or memo that analyzed the FDIC board's uh, bylaws, end quote. For the sake of clarity, did the OCC assist with the CFPB's internal analysis? No. Thank you for that. That means Director Chopra is pulling our leg. Somebody's lying to us here. Um, lie to the committee, Senate Bank, and lie to me. That is a very serious offense, lying to a member of Congress in front of committee. We will take that up with him at a later date. Okay, Mr. Uh, uh, Director Sue, if not the analysis of the CFPB, then what legal analysis did you rely on to determine whether you should participate in the vote? Did the OCC conduct their own analysis? Uh, we did not do any legal analysis. My focus has been and always has been on the policy. So the policy issue that was being discussed at the time was on related to bank mergers. And that my focus was on ensuring that the policy and that uh, request for information document, which kind of- Okay, so you did your own analysis then? Well, I didn't, we didn't do any legal analysis. I mean, we- I didn't I really do any analysis at all. So you took, you voted to upend 100 years of precedent that the FDIC agenda the FDIC chair sets the agenda and didn't even analyze your legal standing to do so? As focus on the policy. That's why I voted uh, uh, for the RFI. There's a process in place, Mr. Stewart, and you didn't follow the process. Uh, That's you, a problem. I believe I followed the process. We were unable to reach a compromise. So well, either you didn't follow the process or you did. If you did follow the process, I, want to, I would like to have you uh, send me an analysis of how you I came to that uh, analysis of what you were going to do. Is that okay? Can you send me analysis on it? Let me, let me take that back. All right. Uh, speaking of participants in that coup, Mr. Grunberg, let's discuss your long history at the FDIC. During your chairmanship, specifically in 2013, the FDIC and DOJ led a government initiative called Operation Choke Point to cut off financial services to legal operating businesses. Specifically, the FDIC created a list of high-risk merchants and activities, I quote. And one of your regional directors even emailed that, and I quote, activities related to payday lending are unacceptable for an insured depository institution, end quote. A comment which led to numerous legally operating businesses getting cut off from financing from banking services. I'd like to point out that the regional manager who did that, who made that statement, is now Mr. Anthony Lowe, and who currently serves as the FDIC ombudsman and is responsible for fielding complaints from banks and businesses that have been negatively impacted by the FDIC. That is a head scratcher. Mr. Grunberg, you were chairman when the choke point happened, and your ombudsman is a key perpetrator of the mentality that created choke point. My question is simple. You plan to bring back Operation Choke Point and limit the financial access for legally operating industries. Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, to the extent Operation Choke Point is represented as uh, pressuring banks not to serve customers who are complying with state and federal law, and as long as the bank has the appropriate management capability, it's the policy of the FDIC that a bank should be able to serve any such customer, and that's been our policy uh, since 2014. Okay, so well, I assume your answer is no then, which I'm glad you feel that way. Uh, I have a joint statement in front of me from every regular here this morning with regards to the independent ATM on industry. And as Madam Chair, I'd like to put this in record. Without objection, such Thank as the Thank you. Order. Within this letter, it states, and I quote, as a general matter, the agencies do not direct banks to open, close, or maintain specific accounts. The agency has continued to encourage banks to manage customer relationships and mitigate risks based on customer relationships rather than decline to provide banking services based on entire categories of customers, end quote. Let me get down the line. Mr. Barr, do you agree with that? 
Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lutkemeyer. It was very difficult to hear the sentence that you read. I was trying very carefully, but I, I, I couldn't hear it. It says, as a general matter, and I'm running out of time here, the agencies do not direct banks to open, close, or maintain specific accounts. Agencies continue to encourage banks to manage customer relationships and mitigate risks based on customer relationships rather than decline to provide banking service to entire categories of customers. It's in the letter you sent me. I assume you continue to agree with that. Sorry, this is a letter that Mr. Grunberg sent? No, it's a letter that you also sent from the Federal Reserve, FDIC, FinCEN, National Credit Union, as well as Comptroller Currency. You yes. Sent it, I, your predecessor probably sent this, but okay, each one of you still agree with this letter? Yes, yes Congress. Thank you very much. We're going to continue to watch you very carefully to make sure energy companies are not being penalized as a result of those activities. This is really important stuff. You guys agreed this morning to stop the nonsense. We're going to follow The gentleman's time you. has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I especially thank you for your boldness and your courage in taking on some of the tough issues of our time. And Mr. Gruenberg, I believe you've indicated that we've had about 14 new banks to open. Is this correct? Yes, Congressman. And um, Mr. Gruenberg, I have intelligence indicating that since 2001, the number of African-American-owned banks have declined by more than half. Is this a fair assessment, sir? Yes, it is, Congressman. And sir, is it true that we have more than 4,000 FDIC-insured banks in this country? And this is as of 2021, and the source is the FDIC as I have it. The actual number being 4,236, but can we safely say that there are more than 4,000 currently? Yes, Congressman. Given that there are more than 4,000, it appears to me from the intelligence that I have that um, approximately 16, we can say less than 20, are MDIs, black-owned MDIs. Is that a fair statement? I, I would want to check on the number, but as I, when I last looked, I believe there were 19 African-American MDIs, but I'd want to check on that to confirm it, Congressman. Well, I think we can agree on less than 20. Yes. Less than 20. Uh, that would make the MDIs less than 1% of the total number of banks in the country, approximately. Um, I find that unacceptable, and I believe a good many other persons would agree, but let's start with you. Do you agree that this number is unacceptable, uh, losing more than half of them in, since 2001, and now having less than 1% of the 4,236? I do agree with that, Congressman. Unacceptable. Um, for edification and for the nation, let me ask all of the uh, regulators, do you concur that less than 1% is unacceptable? If so, would you kindly extend a hand into the air if you concur that 1% of the banks being owned by blacks uh, is unacceptable. Let the record reflect that all have raised their hands. So the question becomes, my dear friends, what do we do about it? What do we do about a circumstance wherein we know that these are the very banks that serve poor people by definition? What do we do about it? Mr. Grunberg, I'll I'll uh, let you take the lead, if you would, please. Thank you, Congressman. As you know, um, uh, we have a statutory obligation uh, to support the development and preservation of minority depository institutions. And um, in particular, in regard to uh, African-American-owned institutions, there has been, as you very accurately point out, a significant decline in the numbers, and those institutions play a vital role in serving the communities in which they're located, and they do a job that other, other institutions may not have an interest in doing. So there's a, there's a compelling public interest in preserving MDIs, generally certainly black-owned MDIs, 
And for the FDIC, I will tell you that is a core priority for us. We have an office at the FDIC devoted to that mission that's deeply integrated with all the divisions of the FDIC and would be glad to sit down with you and your staff and go through the multiple efforts we make. But, but it is a core priority. I appreciate that comment and I'd love to accept your offer. I accept your offer to meet with appropriate persons to discuss this issue because um, at the rate we're going, we are more likely to approach zero than to double the number in the next 10 years. Uh, let's hear from one additional person. Uh, yes, sir, you seem to be willing to move forward and that would be, give your name as you move forward, please. Uh, yes, I'd be happy, uh, Representative Green, to continue the Federal Reserve's uh, work on, uh, on expanding uh, access to, to minority depository institutions, supporting minority depository institutions. I think there's a lot more work uh, to do. Amenable to meeting with me as well? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just say this to you, Madam Chair. Um, in a sense, you are like the Starship Enterprise. You have boldly gone where no man has gone before. And I say men because you're the first and only female to chair this committee. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Green. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chairman Barr. I look forward to getting to know you better and maybe we can compare family uh, trees and see if somewhere along the line uh, we, we have some common ancestry. Um, and I look forward to, to working with you. Let me ask you about your capital review. Um, Chair Powell, as you know, has stated on numerous occasions that the banks are well capitalized and that capital levels are about right. Uh, with your holistic rev review of the capital regime, uh, I am concerned that this undertaking uh, might very well lead to increased capital requirements. I address this issue with Chair Powell uh, in the Humphrey Hawkins hearing, and, and I made the point that Fed tightening, the program, the Fed tightening program that, that you all are undertaking right now is in and of itself insufficient to deal with inflation because you're only dealing with the demand side. There's a supply side uh, to this as well, and uh, I, I wanna ask you, Vice Chair Barr, what impact do you believe that, that um, imposing additional regulatory capital requirements might have on the financial system insofar as sidelining capital might very, be, very well be the opposite of what we need to repair our supply chain. That, that we need to not strand capital, but deploy capital into the real economy at this time so that there is business investment, CapEx, so that we can repair those, that's the, the supply side deficiencies uh, to address inflation. Could you comment on that? Uh, thank you very much, Representative Barr, and I look, look forward to our conversation. Um, in a, in a broad sense, I want to make just a couple points. One is we're trying to look at this holistic review on capital, not with the idea of what capital should be tomorrow or for the next six months, but what is the right level of capitalization in the banking system throughout the cycle over the long term. And any effort that we undertake with respect to capital arrangements would go through the normal notice and comment rulemaking, proposed rule, and so on. The second point I, I want to make is that capital is what makes our banking system strong and able to lend. Mm -hmm. The reason that uh, we have such a dynamic and uh, really active banking system compared to some other parts of the world is because our banking system is really resilient. So having strong capital lets banks land in good times and bad. Yeah, I, so that, I agree. That's if I could just I jump in and interject, I, I agree with that. I think banks are very well capitalized. Uh, post some of the reform, uh, with some of the reforms post financial crisis. I guess the point I want to underscore is that there's a lot of research out there that's found that, that uh, there's a balance to be struck here. And increasing the amount of capital that a bank is required to maintain, no doubt increases the cost of funding and ultimately could decrease the availability of capital to the, the economy. And so, um, uh, um, and, and, and overly uh, strenuous, capital regime uh, could be actually very counterproductive. That's an editorial comment. We can continue to have that discussion. Let me, let me switch over to, to uh, the issue of climate risk. Um, let, let me first start with you, Vice Chair Bart. Uh, does anyone at the Federal Reserve have environmental or climate policy expertise? 
Well, at, at the Federal Reserve, we're really focused only on financial rights. Right. And so to, to restate the question, and anyone there have environmental or climate policy expertise? I, I, that's a, I don't know all the staff involved, but I'll tell you what we're focused on, which is financial risk, not, not climate policy. Right. Let me, uh, Mr. Grunberg, anyone at the FDIC with climate policy, environmental policy expertise? I think we do have uh, people with some expertise in that area, but again, our responsibility is financial risk. Uh, uh, acting comptrollers. Yeah, our, our focus is on risk management. Yeah, no, I, I understand the rhetoric from all of you in this, the, the testimony that uh, supervision of climate risk relates solely to financial risk, safety, and soundness. I hear you and what you're saying. Um, I, I also appreciate the fact that you're saying you're not gonna pressure financial institutions to make credit allocation decisions. But you have to understand the skepticism from, from, from this side here. The president has said that he wants to take a whole of government approach uh, to ending support for fossil fuel. It's simply not credible. Bank regulators for years have taken into account weather-related risks. You all are doing something brand new that's never been done before. You're not looking at credit risk. You're looking at climate-related risk, and you have no expertise to do this. Uh, I want reassurance from all of you. Starting with Vice Chair Barr, do you pledge that with your pilot climate scenario analysis, you will not use this as a gateway for risk weighting to discriminate against carbon intensive industries? Yes, we're, we're not gonna put the thumb on the scale to tell banks to lend to or not to lend to institutions. I've run out of time, but this is something we're gonna be exploring. We're gonna hold you to this commitment uh, that this is not gonna be a used uh, 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 to import international uh, discrimination against certain sectors of the economy. I yield. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, I have a piece of legislation dealing with the Community Reinvestment Act, and I, I actually think that the CRA is extremely important. My assumption is that, uh, Mr. Barr, that the Fed does, and, and well, for that matter, FDIC and uh, the Comptroller of the Currency, that, that CRA is, in fact, uh, an important uh, component of how uh, you deal with uh, financial matters. Um, and the, the, the uh, bill that I have uh, would create uh, additional rating categories uh, that would uh, allow uh, scoring outstanding or satisfactory, and it would ensure that uh, legal violations legal violations uh, would also factor uh, in the rating, uh, and that there is evidence, a lot of it, frankly, uh, that that doesn't happen now. Uh, one West Bank uh, engaged in discriminatory residential housing lending practices uh, for six years, six years, uh, and were actually in violation of the Fair Housing Act, and yet, uh, there was no punishment uh, or downgrading of the CRA score uh, in spite of very obvious, clear, and nationally known violations. Uh, how do we repair that? How do we, how do we prevent that from continuing? Because I, 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 you know, if, if other in institutions see this, and they say, well, we, we can get away with it, there's, there's no penalty, why wouldn't they? I, I agree, Mr. Cleaver, that uh, first of all, that the Community Reinvestment Act is really essential to, to uh, revitalizing uh, communities and, and also that uh, the CRA can and should take into account uh, discriminatory practices uh, in banking uh, organizations. Uh, discrimination has no place in the U.S. banking system, and, and that's why I support the uh, change in the CRA rule that would take that into account and and would um, would result in in downgrades if the activity uh, is significant. Mr. Grudenberg, uh, Congressman, uh, I view uh, bringing to uh, conclusion this rulemaking to um, 
strengthen and modernize CRA as the top priority for the banking agencies. The CRA is about expanding access to credit and basic banking services to low and moderate income communities across the country that have been particularly the most impacted, as we know, by the pandemic. So to me, there's a particular urgency in reaching a conclusion on this rulemaking. And as you may know, the rulemaking provides that uh, discriminatory conduct in extensions of credit or services under banking uh, would be grounds for a CRA downgrade. Um, how long would, would it, assuming that all of the agencies, that the federal agencies uh, agree, I, I'm not aware of any of the agencies that don't, uh, and, I, and I, I believe this can be done without congressional, congressional uh, action. Um, so is, is there any timetable um, when this can be put in place? <laughs> From my standpoint, as fast as possible. I think there's a deep commitment and alignment, if I may say, a, a, among the three banking agencies on this matter. And you always don't want to put a deadline because you, you can't be sure, but I can sure it is a it is the focus of our attention, and I think we are in alignment and quite committed to uh, finalizing this rulemaking. So, thank you. Uh, uh, we can probably expect something probably by Thanksgiving, so that uh, we can all be happy and eat, eat and that, be joyful. That's something I can easily say. We and sooner rather than later. If I'm yes. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in, uh, in full disclosure, I'm from Texas. I'm a car dealer, and I love the banks. So with all that being said, on September 7th, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC jointly reconfirmed their plans to implement the final set of Basel III standards in the U.S. This means that banks will have to abide by increased capital standards, which will lead to less money, being lent out in the real economy to folks like myself. Chairman Powell and Secretary Yellen have both stated that capital levels are more than sufficient. We talked about that today to meet current economic conditions and such financial institutions easily pass their stress test scenarios and we all agree with that. But I do not know why we're going to take this additional step to abide by an interna international standard that will put American financial institutions at a further disadvantage. So Vice Chair Barr, uh, given the banks weathered the, the pan pandemic like they did, the current inflationary cycle, and overall volatile economic conditions, why, again, you've talked a little bit about this, but why should we take another additional step to uh, hold capital? Because when you raise interest rates and you hold capital, you create a heck of a problem for people like me. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Williams, for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, as I said, I'm undertaking a holistic review of our capital requirements. That includes the what you referred to, the, the Basel III endgame. That's finalizing a package of reforms uh, that have been worked on for many years that would make adjustments uh, to market risk and credit risk, operational risk uh, aspects of our capital rules to make them more risk sensitive, uh, to make them work better uh, for our economy, better for the financial institutions, and, and better for the safety and soundness of the financial system. It, it also includes the other elements of capital that we have in the system. And, as I said earlier, when we have a strong capital in this system, that's, that's good for borrowers, it's good for the economy. Yeah, this is America. So, uh, Mr. Gruenberg, in, a, in an October 2022 speech, you stated, the FDIC is not responsible for climate policy. As such, we will not be involved in determining which firms or sectors that financial institutions should do business with. Now, as someone who was personally affected by Operation Choke Point, which was a disaster for, for me and my family for a little while, I agree with your sentiment. However, I don't think that you are truly understand the pressure that the federal government can apply to financial institutions. Again, I've seen it firsthand. If they see you have climate scientists on staff at the FDIC, that could be, that could be enough to scare off community banks immediately and for extending credit to certain companies, again, like myself. So this effect is already affecting credit markets. Now, given the president's hostile rhetoric towards the energy sector in particular, so my question would be, Chairman, 
What proactive steps are the FDIC taking to live up to the words in your October speech that you will not use your agency's power to determine what sectors financial firms can do business with as we thought we saw pressure from Operation Choke Point? Well, thank you for that question, Congressman. Just, I would note that the speech that you referenced, and I, I appreciate you referencing it, uh, I had the opportunity to present that at the annual convention of the American Bankers Association in Austin. Was it a good one? It was, it was terrific. Okay. And it was in Austin, Texas. And I particularly took that opportunity because I, I wanted to go to the ABA convention and, and to the extent this is of particular concern uh, to bankers in Texas, I really welcome the opportunity to talk about uh, how we're going to approach this because this is a new area. And we currently do not incorporate the financial risk of climate change into our uh, supervisory uh, program. And so it's important to communicate clearly what our intentions are here, and in particular to engage with the industry so that they have clarity around that, and that this should be a interactive and collaborative engagement, particularly with the community banks, who I, as you, I think, accurately reference, have particular anxiety about this. So, fair enough, the proof will be in the pudding. We're just beginning this process, but from my standpoint, it needs to be active engagement, explain what we're doing, listen to the industry, and proceed thoughtfully and carefully, and I think there will be also clear distinction in how we approach the larger institutions as opposed to the smaller banks. Remember the little guy and remember the community banks. We do, Congressman, for what it's worth, I believe we do. I chair, I, I, Madam Chair, I give my time back. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen, for, for, for being here. Um, let me just say on, on, on the beginning, I know we're going to have another hearing on uh, in sometime in December. I think the chair is doing it. Uh, I'll be very interested, uh, especially given uh, the collapse of uh, a bankruptcy of FTX. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm focused in trying to agree with regulations, but federal regulations, I agree with that, but concerned about it preempting federal, I mean, state regulations. And the reason why I say that, as I look at the rules uh, in regards to FTX, had they been registered in the state of New York, this could not have happened because of the rules that they've had and the ceiling uh, you know, uh, that they, they would have. So but we'll talk about that in December. But I'm just concerned about crypto and where we go and you know, sort of we make sure that we get it right. So I thought that I'd, just, uh, I'd, I'd start, out, start out with that. My questions then will be, I heard as I walked in, uh, Congressman Cleaver talking about the uh, CRA. Uh, and I am uh, concerned on that also in that, you know, the CRA was basically civil rights legislation to try to make sure that uh, communities uh, uh, of color and, and, and low income have access to capital and banking, et cetera. And then I look at districts like mine where I see banking deserts are starting to uh, occur. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and more individuals are doing their banking as far as younger folks online or other places. So I was wondering whether or not as you're contemplating uh, the proposed CRA rules, uh, whether or not you take into account and figure out how uh, you add the extraordinary role that uh, financial institutions like MDIs and CDFIs uh, play in providing the needed financial services uh, to low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Meeks. Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, MDIs and CDFIs play critical roles in serving low- and moderate-income communities. and that the, the Community Reinvestment Act um, proposal uh, should and, and, and in fact does uh, take that into account. 
Uh, so there, there are provisions that uh, highlight the role that CDFIs and MDIs play and that provide uh, credit uh, uh, towards uh, CRA consideration for investments in support of CDFIs and MDIs acknowledging their, their special role in this space. And, and that the, the rule also takes into account you know, the issue that you raise with respect to, to fair lending and discriminatory practices. So all of that together, I think, is an important part of making a, the CRA proposal strong. And uh, going along with that, because you know, when I look at some of the performance rates, uh, particularly of minority depository institutions, uh, uh, in terms of serving uh, minority and LMI communities. It seems to me MDIs and those that are also CDFIs uh, have a, you know, we look at their track record uh, on economic development uh, in most of these uh, vulnerable communities, it has been very good and proven, very good. But despite this, many of the MDIs struggle uh, to grow with regulations and oversights that fails to account for these special, that's why I asked the other question, because it fails to account for these special circumstances that's challenging, uh, and it's, so they have challenges in raising capital, for example, despite overall strong financial performance, challenges faced by the communities they serve, which are often first and hardest hit in economic down cycles. So uh, I was wondering whether, you know, and this is either one or all of your organizations, depending upon how much time we have, uh, has taken an, a different approach to forming advisory groups uh, and working with minority banks. And can you speak to the work of your respective MDIs advisory committees and how they're engaged with MDIs to mitigate the challenges uh, that I, I just articulated? Thank you for that question, Congressman. You know, at the FDIC, we do have an advisory committee made up of MDIs from across the United States and African American MDIs. Hispanic, Asian American, Native American, and we meet with them several times a year, and they're really a valuable source of information and input for us as we approach our statutory responsibility uh, to support the development and preservation of MDIs. I could go on and would be again. I'd love to follow up with you. My time has expired. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Arkansas Mr. Hill is recognized for five minutes for his comments and questions. Well, I thank the chairman and commend uh, the panel. Thank each of you for your public service and in maintaining a safe and sound banking system. We're all grateful for that and glad that you're with us uh, this morning. Mr. Gruenberg, uh, just a quick yes or no question from you. Is it currently legal for a bank to charge a non-sufficient funds fee and return a transaction when the customer has insufficient funds? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, I, I agree that it is. And that's why this morning I've sent you a, uh, a letter and I'd like to insert it in the record if I might. Without objection. Because I wanna explore this uh, some more with you. When I was home during the August district work period and then uh, back in October, I was stopped uh, by banks of all sizes, uh, mostly in a mix, both Fed and state non-member banks. And they all said to me that uh, recently, in the last few months, FDIC examiners seem to be taking a new interpretation of unfairness, and I put that in quotes, under the Federal Trade Commission Act as seen by the FDIC's March 2022 Consumer Compliance and Supervisory Highlights and its August 2022 Financial Institution Letter. This would mean that charging uh, multiple NSF fees when a merchant resubmits a transaction uh, against insufficient funds and the account would be deemed unfair by Section 5 of that FTC Act. However, in order to conclude that a practice is unfair under that act, I'm sure you know, it must find that it's, quote, is not reasonably avoidable by the consumer, close quote. But customers have ample opportunities to avoid multiple NSF fees in banks, such as when banks notify them time and time again about when an NSF fee can be charged. So Mr. Grunberg, is it now charging multiple NSF fees for repeated 
uh, transactions, uh, do you believe they're not reasonably avoided by customers? It, uh, please. Yeah, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, it, it does depend on, on how the bank handles the issue. You're perfectly right that if a, um, a bank customer writes a check and there's not enough in the account to cover a payment to a merchant, and the merchant asks for payment, the bank can charge an insufficient fund fee. And then if it's represented and if a day it's re later. And, and if it's represented, the uh, uh, bank may be able to charge uh, right. an insufficient fund fee. I think the issue here that was raised in a couple of cases was did the bank disclose to the customer uh, its policy in regard to... Let's assume they did. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think you've got regulation by enforcement going here, and if you want to change the rules on this, perhaps you should consider a rulemaking. Are you going to consider a, a public uh, administrative procedures act rulemaking in this arena? We we did. Uh, you raise a, an important point that there may not have been understanding among bankers as to the the issue here. As you know, uh, we did issue a financial institution right. letter which we tried to lay out in, in some detail. Um, it's a little bit of a, I see this across the regulatory system and I've been, I've spent 40 years on both sides of this equation. I've been in regulation and I've been regulated. And this gotcha situation where we go back and invent a new way to look at things and don't provide adequate notice and then we play got you and we have people essentially paying fines for something they didn't know about for years previously. It happens over at the SEC on steroids. It's not fair to the system. It's not the way we do regulation in the U.S. So again, I invite you to, uh, will you simply go to the, using the API and propose a rulemaking on this? Well, I don't know that I can, well, would have, we can consider that. Would be happy to sit down with you and your staff. Would enjoy that. that. Would and I, I think and we'll, we'll certainly respond to your letter. Yeah, we'll respond to my letter. Uh, Acting Director Sue, same subject. Are you seeing this in, in national banks as well? Has this been? Have you have you done enforcement in the last 60 days on a national bank on this issue? Representment. So um, I'd have to check with my folks. I want to answer that precisely. I don't believe so, but I have to check with my folks. Yeah, I don't think you have either. Uh, so if you would respond to my letter, thanks for the dialogue on this. I think this is not the way we should do regulation by enforcement. Let's have a forward-looking process and be fair. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Chair will recognize himself for five minutes. So I escaped this committee for about two minutes. I went upstairs to the science committee where I sit down. We're talking about the James Webb telescope, space telescope. And the first thing they start talking about is inflation. Inflation of the universe, not inflation of the economy. So just, uh, just to show you, you know, we got the pictures from the James Webb and a number of different things. But I want to talk about inflation, and I want to talk about the steps that you all have been taking, uh, one, to cool that down and then deal with the potential repercussions of that. And I'll give a few uh, points, and you can challenge my assumptions if you want. So... I saw that inflation, there was a report that it was down to 0.2% uh, over uh, October. So it seems to be the uh, raising of interest rates and some other things seem to be taking effect. Um, crypto value, particularly looking at Bitcoin, is down by two-thirds at least, if not three-quarters. So a perceived value of somewhere around $3 trillion down to $1 trillion or less. Stock market's down by about 6,000 points at a billion, <coughs> 200 million per point, so that's about $7.2 trillion. Don't know what residential is. So looking at all of you as regulators, seeing that the economy, there has been some real reduction in perceived value, perceived wealth, what do you see happening uh, with your banks, with the credit unions, financial institutions generally, what kinds of loan losses are being projected? What kinds of cushion do we have in the, within the banking community to deal with foreclosures and failures? So uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, coming into this, uh, 
uh, economic situation is very, very challenging, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, banks are coming into it with uh, high levels of capital, and household balance sheets are generally strong, uh, and, and that's very positive uh, as, as, uh, as we head into this next period in the economy. We're paying attention, of course, to loan losses. Uh, those are, are ticking up, but they're at levels that are not uh, very high right now. We're paying attention to what's happening in the commercial real estate sector and in the residential housing sector, because those are often uh, bellwethers for other risks that are emerging in the system. And, and there are risks you know, in the, in the housing sector from the fact that uh, non-bank uh, mortgage servicers are involved in most of that uh, activity, and they're not very well prepared to, to deal, as, as we saw, you know, more than a decade ago, to, to deal with modifications and foreclosures. So, so that issue we're also paying very careful attention to. Are, are any of you concerned about uh, a contagion or substantial losses to the banking community, to the credit unions, from losses that seem to be occurring in the crypto world? And, and Mr. Grunberg, I'll, I'll turn to you for that one. Yeah, Congressman, I mean, thus far, bank exposure to the crypto uh, market is, is very limited. So um, even with all the turmoil that's taken place in the crypto sector, it really hasn't had thus far concept. What about the stock market and the real estate market, as Mr. Barr was just yeah, referring well, to? Well, I mean, there, particularly on the real estate side and real estate valuations as we go forward here in a rising interest rate environment, you know, that would be a core risk that you know, we'll be, we are paying attention to. Um, you, you mentioned something in your opening testimony about loan loss reserves, so what are you seeing there? Well, we, we have, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, a large accumulation of unrealized losses on the books of our banks um, from uh, securities that, that they're holding on their balance sheet. And I, I mentioned in total about $470 billion. As, as Michael mentioned, our, the industry right now has strong liquidity. So they should be, in the short run, they should be able to, to handle it. But depending on how economic events unfold, if we move into a more stressed environment and institutions may have to sell assets in order to get liquidity, there's really a, a large accumulation of unrealized losses that could then be realized and could have consequence for institutions. And it's one of the things we're, we're paying close attention to. I would say that is, and, and um, asset exposures, particularly in commercial real estate and potentially in housing, are things we're, we're paying attention to. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, who I don't see here. Oh, from Michigan. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Heisinga is recognized for five minutes. Well, I appreciate my friend from Utah recognizing me. Uh, oh, somewhere out there. My, my, my friend uh, west of the Mississippi, so no. Uh, uh, the, uh, the committee will miss you, by the way, my friend. We, we really will. I'm glad you would have been in the minority, but we will miss you nonetheless. Uh, I also am uh, uh, glad that uh, current uh, chair of the subcommittee that I'm the ranking member, uh, Mr. Sherman, acknowledged in his opening remarks that the SEC was, I believe the phrase was, less than perfect. Uh, when it came to uh, FTX, uh, I, I don't know whether he used air quotes around less than perfect, but I certainly would. Yes, they were less than perfect. And I would note, oversight anyone? It has been a year, a year, so half of the 117th Congress since this committee has had Gary Ginsler in front of it. So uh, that will be something I think we will be rectifying and we will be moving on. Uh, 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 as we're dealing with, uh, with the real uh, issues surrounding crypto and certainly uh, FTX and what happened there. It, it, to me, it seems a bit like uh, Enron met Bernie Madoff, but we'll find out. Um, so, uh, uh, Vice Chair Barr, I want to uh, touch base with you on a couple of quick things here. Um, obviously, the Federal Reserve, as well as the FDIC and OCC, uh, have been working through interagency, I believe they're called policy sprints, 
uh, and the P Presidential Working Group on Financial Markets to examine the benefits and risks related to bank involvement in digital asset activities. What is the future of these uh, policy sprints and how does the Federal Reserve plan to continue to work with other prudential regulators? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are working uh, together, uh, the OCC, the FDIC, and the Fed, uh, looking at uh, prudential issues that uh, might arise when banking organizations are engaged in uh, a broader range of uh, activities, including uh, crypto-related activities. Uh, each, each of our agencies has uh, taken steps to wrap our arms around what is currently happening in, in the banking space. Uh, for our part, we issued a letter earlier this year with respect to required notifications when banks engage in these activities. And we've been working together to try and provide some greater clarity uh, to banks uh, about the guardrails that need to be in place uh, with respect to it, safe and sound conduct. It, it, so it sounds a little more like a descriptor of what's currently going on. Any major plans quickly, changes to that plan? We, we expect to, to be able to provide a greater guidance uh, and clarity okay. to firms engaged in this space so that they, if they're engaged in crypto-related activities, they do that uh, within clear guardrails. To date, there are very few banks that have been engaged in this activity, and, and so we want to make sure we get those rules in place while the right. level of activity is relatively muted. Okay, so uh, I've got two minutes left here. Obviously, the SEC will play a vital role in enforcing whatever framework Congress comes up with. Um, <clears throat> when Treasury Undersecretary uh, Liang was here in February to discuss the Presidential Working Group on Financial Markets, I asked her a similar question about coordination among agencies, specifically with the SEC. Uh, so again, you mentioned coordination with the uh, OCC, FDIC. Uh, what what can you say though to confirm sort of the uh, the coordination on the SEC with digital assets? We also are in regular conduct uh, contact with the SEC and the CFTC uh, individually and through the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Council. Okay. Um, you emphasized in your remarks striking the quote, striking the right balance between creating an environment that supports innovation and managing related risks is no easy task, close quote. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And as this committee evaluates the regulatory framework, framework for stable coins, we uh, should seek to encourage responsible financial services innovation, however. And in fact, that was something that the Republicans have developed a principal statement on that, one of those uh, items being to not prevent entrance into the marketplace by new players with excessive regulation. Um, how would you explain how limiting stablecoin issuance to banks would not disincentivize the innovation that led to development of stablecoins? Thank you. I, I think it's really critical that there be strong federal oversight, strong supervision, regulation, and, and approval of these activities, precisely because stablecoins are, are a form of private money. With uh, in history, we've seen. We've got. Ten, I got ten. I got ten seconds. I know the history, but uh, do you believe that Congress must pass legislation to clear regulatory, uh, to clearly put regulatory framework around that? Yes, I think it's critical for, for Congress to step in and, and pass strong federal oversight of stable coins. Okay, uh, my time has expired. Thank you. Gentlemen from Michigan's time has expired. I, I, sorry, I, you know, Minnesota, Michigan, you guys all look alike up there. So uh, uh, I turn the, my attention and recognize now the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, who's also the chair of the task force <laughs> on artificial intelligence. He's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to our witnesses. And I guess first I'd like to start by thanking our financial regulators in the U.S. Uh, for the remarkable fact that in the 12 years since we passed Dodd-Frank, we have not had a financial crisis. Uh, it was not always thus, thus, and I think enhanced capital requirements are a very important part of that. Um, now, Vice Chair Barr, as you undertake your holistic review of the capital requirements, um, I would like you to reconsider and consider recent international experience with contingent capital instruments. You know, one of the significant authorities that you were provided by Dodd-Frank, but which FSOC has not so far used, is to require systemically important financial institution to issue contingent capital instruments as part of their capital. 
Uh, this, to my mind, has several major advantages. Uh, first, it prevents contagion by providing an automatic pre-negotiated recapitalization of a bank that gets in trouble without putting the diff and, or ultimately the federal taxpayer on the hook for bailing out giant bank failures. Secondly, it provides a market-based incentive for bond traders to look deeply into the books and the risk posture of giant banks, providing an early warning signal for banks before they get into trouble and encouraging them to raise capital while they still can. There was a very good, at the time of the crisis, I think it was Strongen's group inside Goldman Sachs, did a very interesting counterfactual analysis of how much better the crisis would have been if banks had been required to hold contingent capital instruments. And I think that analysis um, is still relevant. Uh, thirdly, it, they provide a market-based incentive for giant banks to adopt a less risky posture simply in order to get the best possible price for its contingent convertible bonds. Uh, and so, you know, the co combined uh, the combined effect of all of these things, I think, will get us hopefully more near the uh, being able to address the the failure of the Mogliani Miller theorem, which I will not ask you about, as it applies to giant banks. Uh, but um, you know, and but as I mentioned, the U.S. regulators have not so far used this authority, but other regulators have, with I believe very positive results. Uh, you know, at first, the, the risk premium for cocoa bonds, which is not large, that was one of the big worries about it. It hasn't happened. Uh, secondly, the bond markets have provided useful early, early warning signals, for example, uh, for the slow motion agony of Deutsche Bank or the more rapid ongoing dismemberment of Credit Suisse. Um, and all of this occurred without a whiff of contagion. So to my mind, they, they worked pretty much as people hoped. And so my, my question for you is, you know, what is your view of uh, contingent capital requirements, and will you take a new look at them as part of your holistic review? Uh, thank you very much, uh, as always, for your thoughtful question. Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, if you take a step back and think about the different types of, uh, of these instruments, we do have a form of these instruments in the, in the current framework with respect to what people call gone concern capital. That is, in the event of a resolution of a globally systemically important bank, there's a long-term debt requirement at the GSIB level, at the holding company level, that is in effect converted into equity into the, in the new institution when a bridge bank is created in resolution. But, but I that don't has, believe that doesn't really provide a useful market signal when a bank starts to be within sight of getting in trouble. Right, it, 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 it doesn't perform the same exact function as uh, going concern uh, arrangement uh, people think of in terms of COCOs. Uh, there, there is some risk with COCOs that, uh, you know, as you get uh, close to those buffers, you might uh, see runs. It might accelerate runs or contagion. And, and so... I think it's appropriate to be cautious about that. And so in my own view, you know, I prefer the gone concern uh, form of this instrument because it's only triggered on resolution and, and therefore it doesn't have that kind of potential for contagion, but it still performs the loss absorbing function, which is I, the I other believe there, there are trigger that mechanisms instrument. that have been avoid that have been developed that avoid you know, what you're worried about, people gaming the trigger point, stuff like that. So I think there's been a lot of progress on, on that. And um, anyway, so I encourage you, and I will continue to pester you about having a good, uh, you know, a serious look at that. Because it, it is, in the, in the 12 years since we passed Dodd-Frank, a lot has been learned, and they really avoid a lot of the, certainly the political agony we went through when we had to pass TARP and, and so on. And, and the last 12 years of, of discussion about what appropriate capital requirements are. Uh, I welcome our further conversations. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Uh, thank the chairman. Thank uh, the witnesses. Appreciate your work uh, to keep our markets functioning safe and soundly. Um, and, you know, fintech is certainly one of the dynamic factors shaping our economy and certainly the financial services space. Uh, we've wrestled with the fact that <clears throat> really this body, Congress, hasn't provided the legal clarity that, that would help you do your jobs more effectively. 
that's left uh, many of you in the lurch. Uh, certainly, you, you know, uh, Mr. Sue, you've responded to a letter we sent recently. Thank you for your response. Um, but kind of came at things very differently than your predecessor, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, the market's having fits trying to react to all this. And so, you know, my hope is that we'll provide some legal clarity from Congress. But as you guys uh, function in your role uh, as regulators and potentially in rulemaking, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of um, impact for what you're doing. So, Mr. Grunberg, uh, efforts at FDIC's FDI tech office seem to have slowed since its chief innovation officer resigned earlier this year. Uh, while efforts at similar offices at OCC and the Federal Reserve have significantly increased, uh, the Federal Reserve in particular is pretty dynamic on what we hope doesn't turn into a Chinese Communist Party creepy surveillance state central bank digital currency. Uh, nevertheless, studying the digital dollar uh, could be fruitful, as long as it doesn't go down that path. Uh, so to highlight some of the innovation there, but, but Mr. Grunberg, can you discuss the impacts of this slowdown at FDI Tech uh, and um, how, how's that affecting FDIC regulated banks? I appreciate the question, Congressman. Um, uh, we do have a group at the FDIC dedicated in some sense to a forward-looking approach on how technology can be applied uh, to banking regulation and to the mission of the FDIC. We think that's an important group that has significant value to the agency. Uh, we do have a new director of that group. And we have, the only change we've made, we have incorporated, the, the group is still a separate group, but we've now incorporated it into our larger chief information officer organization so we could realize the synergies between the uh, FDI tech and our uh, mainstream DI uh, information technology program. It'll be a priority for us. We, we are working on a number of initiatives for the coming year, and you know, we'd be happy to stay in touch and keep you informed in regard yeah, to the work we do. Thank you for that, and, and frankly, with the kind of role of the CFPB nearly trying to take over FDIC, uh, one thing I'll highlight is that uh, CFPB's 1033 um, privacy rulemaking uh, that they're under, we look forward to seeing how that comes, because. Uh, the role of fintechs can be great if consumers can fundamentally own their data. So if that data can be shared, then you can do great things. But if they can have ownership over it and reclaim it, then they can kind of check uh, the power of this. But the uh, clarity that comes with fintech, and you know, certainly we touched on this as we were talking with the OCC in our letter, uh, is big. But you know, before I run out of time, Mr. Barr, yesterday at the Senate hearing, you stated that crypto needed to be regulated in a manner similar to more traditional finance. Uh, yeah, however, can't much of the FTX situation that was being discussed be attributed to traditional finance? Didn't this largely offshore company, which was outside uh, the purview of U.S. regulators, utilize traditional finance channel, channels, uh, it seems, in a, in a fraudulent manner? Uh, and you look potentially some of the mark-to-market considerations, if you take the tweet threads of uh, their CEO at face value, uh, play a factor. Those are traditional finance tools. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the question. I, uh, you know, I, I don't know the underlying facts of FTX other than what I read in the newspaper, so I want to be super careful not to comment on a particular, particular company. But, but broadly speaking, the kinds of issues that are raised are precisely what you wouldn't be able to do in a bank. Uh, you wouldn't be able to um, you know, hold customer, say you're holding customer assets and that, not hold them. Well, so the you're not really allowed to do that anywhere because when you say you have them and you don't, that's normally considered fraud. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I think that, you know, the basic concepts are the same, and so you want to have a, a system that, that doesn't permit that kind of activity to occur, and, and that's really what I'm saying. We need the same kind of regulation for the same kind of risk. Yeah, and I, I just say broadly, um, you know, I don't think, the protocols were here, the, the issue, issues, the, the actors. So if you look at the underlying protocols uh, for, you know, the, the assets, uh, you still see certainty, say, in proof of work versus proof of stake, some of the trade-offs there. Last thing is this would be a horrible time to end self-custody. Uh, at the end of the day, the uh, individual owning their own assets is a safeguard.
I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentlewoman from Ohio will ask her questions and give her comments remotely. Ms. Beatty, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion, and she is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, let me say thank you to Chairwoman Waters and thank you, uh, Chair Paul Mulder, uh, for sitting in today. And, and let me just say, uh, let me start with my time by thanking Congressman Al Green for bringing up the issue of MDIs. This is very personal to me because I'm fortunate enough to have a brand new MDI that is in progress uh, today in my district, Adelphi. I'm also fortunate to have standing with me today the founder and vice chair on our virtual audience, Kevin Boyce. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to pledge to him, my district and the nation, that we will continue to stand up for MDIs because certainly we know when black families get their mortgage loan, 70% of them will get it with an MDI bank. Conversely, with a majority bank, that goes to 1%. So uh, let that be noted in the record, uh, please. And thank you to the FDIC for all of the work uh, that you continue uh, to do uh, with our financial institutions. Now, let me move on um, to uh, my question. Uh, it goes to you, Chairman Harper. In a recent uh, paper issued by the NCUA Office of the Chief Economist, found that minority credit union borrowers had higher denial rates for loans applications. And when minority borrowers did get loans, Black and Hispanic credit union borrowers paid higher interest rates than white borrowers. You know where I'm going with this. Can you tell me how do you explain these findings and what is NCUA doing to improve these stats going forward? So first of all, I just want to uh, provide clarity. I, you're talking about the borrower being a, a person of color borrowing from a credit union, not necessarily confusing that with a minority depository institution credit union. Because we, Absolutely. I've moved on and I have moved on, brought closure. Yep, yep, yep. And so now let's go to your area. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, it was a telling study. Uh, we built the study out based on some research that the FDIC did in this area. I recently spoke about it at our uh, conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion, where we highlighted that yeah. this really highlights the need for us to enhance our fair lending program. Since I have become chairman, we've been adding resources to our fair lending office. Um, we also need to be looking at more than just HMDA data when we are determining where to do our risk-focused exams. Uh, you've got my commitment that we will continue to build on that because for me, uh, a borrower should be given a fair price regardless of their color. Well, let me say thank you and let me make particular notice for the record that you mentioned uh, the, how important it is in the value of diversity and inclusion. Yep. And certainly as the chair of DNI, I think it speaks not only to all of my colleagues, but also to the nation about the value and the importance that we have when we practice diversity and inclusion, especially in our financial institutions. Also let the record show that when Congresswoman Maxine Waters did the first ever DNI, we have gotten more results from financial institutions, including all of you who are there. And I wanna thank you for, protect, for practicing diversity and inclusion. And that is beyond race and ethnicity. Absolutely. It is thought, it is geographics and how you operate. So thank you again. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentle lady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is now recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, and, and I want to join my colleagues in, uh, in saying it has been my great honor and privilege to serve with you, and, and we'll miss those days. Um, I want to thank Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member uh, McHenry for holding the hearing, and I believe that it is important to hold these hearings with our regulators. As many of you know, this is the first hearing that the majority has held since July 20th with a Biden administration official. That's 119 days, which I believe is unacceptable. 
One of our core responsibilities as members of Congress is oversight, and we cannot conduct adequate oversight when the majority is shielding the administration from scrutiny. We should have held uh, a hearing last month with SEC, SEC Chair Gensler, like our counterparts in the Senate, but the majority declined to uh, summon the, the chair here. Now it's more important than ever that we haul Mr. Gensler before the committee to get answers on what role he played and what he knew in the lead up to the collapse of uh, Democratic megadonor Sam Bankman Freed's crypto exchange FTX. Now, as time is limited, I will dive right into my questions. Um, Acting Chair Grunberg, uh, on October 18th, the FDIC voted to raise deposit insurance assessment rates for banks by two basis points. The change amounts to a 54% increase in the current average assessment rate. The FDIC has stated that the changes will remain in effect until the deposit insurance fund reserve ratio reaches the FDIC's long-term goal of 2%, although the statutory minimum is 1.35%. Acting Chair Grunberg, uh, going forward, what will be the FDIC's plan for reducing the significant de deposit insurance fund assessments once that target is reached, especially given that deposits are currently dropping? Well, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the, the FDIC as a matter of law is required to maintain a minimum reserve ratio for our deposit insurance fund. That's the ratio of the fund to all insured deposits. And if the reserve falls below 135, we're required by law to implement a restoration plan to restore it to the 135 minimum. And under the law, we have eight years to do it. And what happened in this instance is that in 2020, particularly once the pandemic hit, we had an inflow of insured deposits and it pushed down the reserve ratio. We initially announced the restoration plan and did not think we'd have to raise assessment rates. We thought we could restore the fund to the minimum without raising rates. And that was based on a projection that as the pandemic diminished, the increase in insured deposit growth would slow down. And what's happened is, frankly, over the past year, we've had a high rate of insured deposit growth, over 4%. And what it did was it put in question whether we'd be able to meet the statutory requirement of restoring the minimum to 1.35 within the time frame. So we had a tricky call to make, quite frankly. Either bump up rates now, or wait and hope the problem could take care of itself, which is a possibility. But you also run the risk that if we, that doesn't happen, we could have to impose a higher assessment on the industry at a less favorable time. That's why we impose the 2%, the, the two basis point increase. That two basis points is about 1.2% of industry income. And we do not think as a practical matter, it'll have an impact on lending or credit availability but it'll give us a high assurance of restoring the fund to the minimum and will put the fund in a stronger position to deal with an uncertain economic environment. And then on the 2% uh, designated reserve, it gets a little complicated here to explain. We have under the law a minimum reserve ratio of 135 and also authority to set a higher designated reserve ratio, which is, uh, designed to be able to withstand a severe financial crisis. And that's a longer term goal. So the shorter term would be to reach 135 within the statutory time frame. The 2% is probably not reached until sometime in the 2030s, but it would still, so we build it up slowly and gradually, but it does add resilience to the fund. And based on historical analysis, it would allow the fund to weather even a severe financial crisis and as you know, in 2008, the fund was depleted and ended up being over 20 sure. billion. So, it, you know, you want to avoid a repetition of that if we can. Well, thank you. I see that my time's expired. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is recognized for his questions. And well, I comments. thank the chair. He looks even much taller up there today. Very good. I want to thank um, the chair. Waters for this hearing, uh, the ranking member, and uh, the witnesses here today. In particular, I want to join my good friend, 
Mr. Hill and he is my good friend and thanking you for your service. Uh, clearly you could be making multiples of the amount of money that you're making here today uh, in the private sector, but you believe in public service. So we appreciate that very much and thank you for your service. I was uh, first on this committee about eight years ago and the villain at that time was Dodd-Frank. Every time, in fact, I think some of my colleagues would have preferred to call it Lucifer Satan and not Dodd-Frank. And all I heard was how negative it was, how terrible it was, and how uh, abusive it was to the banks. However, when the large bankers were here, the CEOs, I asked them if it had been helpful during uh, the pandemic. They all said yes. So I ask you the same question. Has Dodd-Frank, as a federal law, been helpful during this very stressful time? My, some of my colleagues have called it a real-life stress test the last two, two, three years, and I agree with that. Has it been helpful? Uh, Mr. Barr, why don't you handle the first one since you're eager at the, at the post. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Vargas. Yes, I think the Dodd-Frank Act has been uh, quite helpful in providing uh, a resilient base for the financial system uh, since its enactment. As part of the set of reforms in the wake of the global financial crisis, I think it's made our banking system uh, and our financial system more broadly much more resilient uh, and sa safer and fairer. Uh, and so I applaud uh, Congress for getting that done. Thank you. Runger, go ahead, sir. Uh, Congressman, I, I very much agree, agree with that. I think as a result of Dodd-Frank, we strengthened capital and liquidity requirements and uh, strengthened the oversight of uh, financial derivatives, all of which really strengthened the resilience of the financial system and put us in a much stronger position to deal with the stress particularly that we experienced during the pandemic. Mr. Harper, you've been shaking your head yes, but could you answer on the record? Uh, absolutely. I, I concur with all that has been said. Um, Dodd-Frank has also contributed uh, because of focus on protecting consumers, uh, and we've certainly been doing that, making sure the pandemic assistance programs are appropriately Thank you. Uh, channeled. Mr. Sue. I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. Uh, I would add a word of caution, though, that the banking system and the financial system is dynamic. And that does require us to also be dynamic with it and to, make, right. to stay on top of those risks. I, I agree with that, but I, I wanted to know about the law itself. Has it been helpful? And I think it has been. So we have industry agreeing with the regulators. Uh, I wish you would have been here eight years ago to listen to all the BS that we listened to. But anyway, um, the issue of financial risk versus climate risk. For the last 20 years, I've believed very deeply in climate change and climate risk. I live in California. We're susceptible to that. Um, not so much for the flooding, but more for the wildfires. You today were asked to answer very narrow questions on financial risk versus climate risk. Before coming here, I was a vice president in a corporate in a Fortune 100 company in the insurance business. Our actuaries certainly believed that the climate change created risk. There's no doubt about that. Um, and we had to reserve that way and we had to charge that way. Here you're saying very carefully that you know, you look at financial risk, not climate risk, financial risk. Mr. Barr, why don't you go ahead and handle it first? We're, um, we're trying to explore exactly that question. Uh, and obviously, uh, the changing climate around us both today and, and in the long term is going to change lots of things about the economy. And as that happens, we want to be sure that the financial institutions we regulate and supervise are managing the financial risks from those changes. Uh, and so our beginning effort in that is to work with our other sister agencies on guidance for financial institutions and then to conduct this pilot climate scenario analysis exercise to really make sure that financial institutions are developing the appropriate risk framework for that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And again, I appreciate you doing that because I do see it and we're going to see it in everywhere. David Beasley, who is uh, over at the UN, even says the issue of migration is affected dramatically by climate change, and so will, I think, financial risk. Um, and lastly, I don't have, I have 13 seconds. The whole issue of cryptocurrency, normally I hear a lot of cheerleading on the other side from a few members. That was a little muted today. I didn't hear the cheer, cheerleading going on because of the collapse of FTX. But I hope we do uh, take a look and regulate in a way that, uh, that can help the public. Thank you. My time's up. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is now recognized for five minutes for his comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
So President Biden has made it clear his belief that fossil fuels should be phased out as quickly as possible, regardless of the economic and national security consequences. In fact, President Biden's energy policies have directly contributed to record high gas prices. To make matters worse, some of his past nominees have said that banks banks should not even lend to fossil fuel companies in order to fight climate change. Each of you have said something to the effect that your agency is not responsible for climate change policy. And I agree with that. Would each of you agree that your agency does not have the necessary expertise to regulate climate? Let's go from left to right. Who's left and who's right? So let's start with Mr. Barr. Uh, we're at, at the Fed, we're 100% focused only on financial risks. We're not interested in getting involved in climate policy. That's, that's for other parts of the government. And, and Congressman, we don't have authority to regulate climate. Uh, our, our, our job is financial risk. Agreed. Thank you. I agree. Well, again, uh, going down the line, so how are you ensuring that any, any guidance your agency issues on risk management is not construed as a directive for financial institutions to not lend to fossil fuel companies? Uh, All right, Mr. Barr again, go down. We've, we've made it quite clear, I've made it clear personally that the Federal Reserve is not in the business of telling uh, banks to lend to particular sectors or firms or not to lend to particular sectors or firms. That's not an appropriate uh, policy. Our guidance uh, and our work with financial institutions is about financial risk management, and we're going to be sticking to our knitting. And I would say, Congressman, you know, all we have thus far is proposed guidance. We haven't even finalized the initial guidance on the subject. And we're already, all of us, frankly, going to pains to try to be clear on this issue to the industry. And, uh, uh, and the point, another point worth making is that it's not as if, as if industry does not have a lot of experience in, in terms of managing the financial risks of climate change. And the industry is actually, the banking industry has actually done this pretty successfully, whether it's banks in coastal areas or in the agricultural sector or in communities reliant on the energy sector, banks have a lot of experience that we can learn from, and we're obviously, first in the first instance, going to have to engage with them around this subject, I think. We are earlier in the process on this, Congressman. Uh, we're working through a request for information that I expect the board to be voting on in the near future. Um, we'll be gathering input from all sources and certainly working to ensure that any guidance, any assistance that we give in terms of developing tools to help credit unions to manage climate-related financial risk does not put a finger, as was earlier said, or a thumb on the scale of making a loan decision. We're doing all the same things. The one. Well, thank you. You still have Mr. Sue. Yeah, sorry. So we're doing. We're taking a very similar approach at the OCC. We also have an Office of Climate Risk, so we're centralizing how we're both thinking, teaching, talking, examining, uh, so to ensure a bit more consistency in how we approach it. Well, thank you all for those answers. I only have a minute left here. So let me say, while I know, frankly, for political purposes and misguided purposes, some people hate coal, coal is critical to my state's economy and it supports tens of thousands of good paying jobs for hardworking West Virginians. I appreciate your answers. Hope I can count on you. Stick with it. Stick with your word in saying that your goal is not to enact climate policy. The federal government should tell banks and credit unions which companies to deny financing to. Given this administration's approach, however, towards coal, oil, and natural gas, hope you understand that we West Virginians remain skeptical. But thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I welcome all of the members uh, to uh, the committee. This has been very interesting. Uh, my first question will go to Mr. Sue. Uh, the cost of weather and climate disaster-related events 
uh, is on the rise. With over 15 separate uh, billion dollars related weather and climate disaster event, uh, so far this year, according to the NOAA, how can community banks best incorporate risk management practices in order to address the climate-related financial risks? Well, thank you for the question. Um, so, a couple things. Most community banks have, to date, successfully in handling certain extreme weather events. Hurricanes are not new, floods are not new. However, what is new is the severity and the frequency of some of those events and the scope of some of those events. And what we are encouraging when we talk to community banks is that, A, they learn from each other, they learn from us. There are other resources to turn to to say, what can we learn from these things to apply to how we adapt and deal with these various issues? We, as an agency, are committed to that. that and I think that that's a, it's a good place to start. I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of learning in general, whether it's for community banks or for the larger banks, as to how to, how to best approach this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is to any of the witnesses, uh, uh, and we've heard some of it discussed uh, earlier. If the racial wealth gap remains significant with the medium network of typical white households uh, beginning a 7.8 times greater uh, than a typical black household in 2019. Historically, black communities have been left out of the traditional banking system. How does racial equity factor into your priorities for the upcoming year, and what policies or action will be implemented to uh, close the gap? And that's for anyone on the committee. I'm, I'm happy to, to start, uh, uh, Congressman. I, I do think that it's important that we have a banking system that works for everybody. Uh, we need to have an inclusive banking system that, that serves uh, minority uh, households and businesses uh, and, and the broader uh, uh, public in the same way. There's, there's no place for discriminatory practices in the banking sector. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a strong enforcement uh, of uh, anti-discrimination laws here in the United States and that we take affirmative steps uh, to make sure that uh, the financial system is serving uh, all communities. And that, that includes work like that's been going on around the country through bank on efforts, uh, trying to get uh, banks to offer safe and affordable accounts, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, it includes the work that the agencies are doing together uh, to modernize the Community Reinvestment Act and make sure that it's uh, serving its uh, purposes. It includes efforts to uh, reform the payment system, uh, such as efforts uh, including FedNow, uh, to make sure that the payment system is supporting households and businesses the way it's supposed to. So I think in a, in a holistic sense, uh, there's lots of work uh, still to do, but, but these are the elements that I think uh, could support a more inclusive financial system. That's a great uh, response. Anyone else would like to respond on this issue? I got about another minute. Yeah, Congressman. Uh I would agree with everything Michael said. I think from the standpoint of the banking agencies and the FDIC, we have core responsibilities to enforce fair lending. We have a particular obligation to follow through on the rulemaking on the Community Reinvestment Act, which I think will be directly responsive to the issue. And for the FDIC, expanding access to the banking system um, has been a core priority, and as you know, um, a disproportionate number of minorities and African Americans are outside of the banking system, and that's a real obstacle uh, to economic advancement. So w we do have a role to play, I think. Okay, thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Uh, uh, Mr. Harper would like to respond to your question, Mr. Um, yeah, okay, no, go just, ahead, Mr. Harper. Just very quickly, uh, two things I want to highlight that uh, we're working on. One is um, with respect to our Minority Depository Institutions exam program, we're taking a look at what are the peer metrics that they should be compared to because there are oftentimes in the examination process that there's not an understanding of the business model that there may be higher expenses, but there are actually lower charge-offs and defaults in the long term, and we want to make sure that we're addressing that. And secondly, all of our agencies are working on the issue of appraisal bias. Um, we're working through uh, two rulemakings. 
Um, and, and you have to remember that one of the greatest ways you can build wealth in this country is through home ownership, and an appraisal is a key part of that. We're working through two rules. One is on automated valuation models, and the second is on reconsideration of values, and we'll continue to do that this year. Okay, Mr. Lawson's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate, appreciate uh, you holding today's hearing. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, appreciate you being here. Um, Want to wanted dialogue with you a little bit on bank capital requirements. Uh, we had a little bit of a conversation earlier today on that. I think your words were that you want to conduct a holistic review uh, of Ameri American bank capital requirements. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, so in, inside of that, just trying to get some understanding as to kind of your analysis. In looking at the statements of others in this broader space, Secretary Yellen noted uh, that during the pandemic, quote, our financial system did very well because of the improvements in capital liquidity, risk management, and stress testing. Uh, the Fed's recent uh, financial stability report uh, showed that large banks are in a strong position to weather a substantial economic downturn. Uh, do you agree or disagree with either of those uh, two comments? Either with Janet Yellen or with the Fed, uh, the, the Fed's recent financial stability report? I, I, I agree with both statements. I think, as I've said uh, publicly, um, capital in the financial system today is strong, and that's what made our financial system resilient. And so the point of the holistic review is to say, are the, all the capital rules working right together, and are they at the right level? You know, saying something strong doesn't necessarily answer the question, is it strong enough? And how do the rules work together to make sure that they're most effective and efficient? And that's really what I'm looking at. Okay, I appreciate that clarity. To, to gain insight for us here as policymakers, knowing that the Fed is reacting with blunt instruments to what is a really difficult, uh, broader macroeconomic situation due to what my view is is really reckless fiscal spending by Congress, not the Fed's issue, Congress's issue. And the Fed is then responding to that with higher interest rates. But as we look at the role of the bank capital requirements, what would be the economic impact of raising bank capital requirements, in your, your opinion? Well, let me just start by saying I, we're, we're looking at capital requirements over the long term. We're not trying to think about timing capital requirements for tomorrow. We're trying to think about what's the right through the cycle set of capital requirements. So I'm not thinking about you know, the particular economic moment right now, I'm trying to think about it for the long term. In general, strong capital requirements permit banks to lend in good times and in bad, and, and so that's the framework I'm using to, to analyze the issue. That's fair, that's good clarity. In the, in the short term, what would the economic impact be of raising bank capital requirements? Understanding, the, I understand you're taking a holistic long-term view. What would be the economic impact in a, in a short-term analysis of raising bank capital requirements? Well, any, any bank capital rule would require basically a, a proposal, seeking public comment, analyzing that comment, issuing a final rule, and then in putting in place an implementation timeline. So the, the whole point of that is not to have sudden changes um, in the long-term capital rules uh, that, that we're developing. Fair, fair, and I think that's good feedback, but the concern of making short-term changes would be what? Would there be a, a negative economic impact of raising bank capital requirements in a short-term analysis? I understand you're, you're looking holistically, you're looking long-term, I think that's, that's, that's good, but just so we, we have on the record is, a, is, a, the, is the short-term impact of raising bank capital requirements uh, a negative economic impact uh, macroly? Um, it, it, it's not, there's not a yes or no answer to that question. It depends on the way in which you implement the capital changes and uh, how banks respond to those capital changes over time. So it could have quite a positive effect um, or it could have a negative effect depending on the structure of the capital rule. Okay, I, I appreciate that feedback. I, I have concerns of, of raising those requirements and the, the negative economic impact they have, but we'll, we'll look to this holistic review and, and what some of the feedback is uh, that you receive at that time as to how, the best way to move forward. Uh, let me shift gears um, pretty significantly, if I can, over to you, uh, Mr. Guenberg, um, in, in dive into a particular, um, some of the FinTech uh, that we're seeing and the impact that it's having on changing businesses. Could you just add a little more color in the, how the FDIC is working to streamline compliance uh, and innovation for FinTech service companies? Well, we have, a, we have institutions that do partner with fintech service companies um, uh, to provide banking services. And 
uh, it, it, the management of those third party relationships is from our standpoint, uh, a core risk management issue. These partnerships can have value, but it's important for the institution to understand that when they partner with a third party and that third party is providing banking services on, on behalf of the bank, it's as if the bank is directly providing those services. So from our standpoint, it's important for the institution to carefully manage that relationship so that they can realize the benefits and, and avoid the downside risks that could come with it as well. Thank you very much. Cognizant of my time, I yield back. Gentlemen yields back for the benefit of the panel and uh, members in the room. Uh, we will have a hard stop at 1.30, depending upon how many questions, how many people want to ask questions. Uh, gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd first like to begin by acknowledging you and um, mentioning or expressing that uh, it has been quite a pleasure to fight for marijuana alongside you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> I would also like to begin by thanking my chairwoman for this, uh, this hearing today, for thanking the regulators for being here. Uh, I did want to echo sentiments from uh, my colleague, Mr. Green, who referenced our chairwoman as the Starship Enterprise, boldly going where no man has gone before. Uh, this chairwoman uh, took the unprecedented leadership step in ceding a territory on the exclusive committee that is the, fin the House Financial Services Committee. And as the representative from Guam, I just so happened to have that privilege. I wanted to, on the record, thank her for um, welcoming all American people to the big table that is this House Financial Services Committee. I'd like to thank my colleagues for welcoming me and for my minority colleagues for the consummate professionalism. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to first begin with some housekeeping. There was some dialogue earlier today to my understanding um, that there may have been some communications between the OCC and the committee um, that uh, need to have some documentation included in the record. So I would, without objections, like to ask that um, a particular response from Director Chopper of the OCC be entered into the record without objections. Without objections. Without objection, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, for the, and for the panel, uh, the American people continue to um, struggle under the burden of high inflation. Uh, the Federal Reserve is doing the necessary policy response in raising interest rates to try and combat the uh, circumstances. Uh, as, our, as our public continues to um, deal with the inflationary pressures and now the added pressures of higher interest rates that are going to be causing their debt service requirements to go up, particularly in revolving credit, but also in, in some uh, consumer credit that's going to be adjusting. Uh, there is a very high likelihood that the um, increase in 30-day delinquencies is going to start picking up and that that uh, increase in 30-day delinquencies could be a harbinger for um, what is going to be added difficulty in, um, in debt service and, of course, in making ends meet for um, our public. I wanted to first begin by asking um, Mr. Barr, uh, is the Federal Reserve monitoring closely the 30-day um, delinquency rates, and is, uh, is the Federal Reserve considering that as they weigh uh, interest rate policy? Yes, we, we closely follow uh, delinquencies across a range of consumer and business uh, markets, and we consider that as part of our uh, view into what's going on in financial and economic conditions in the economy. It, it goes into our thinking overall. Very good. And, and for the um, actual regulators of our financial institutions, are we seeing an uptick in revolving credit delinquencies and in 30-day delinquencies? Yeah, Congressman, you really raise an interesting point uh, that we actually flag. The FDIC puts out a quarterly banking profile, and in the most recent one for the second quarter, you know, credit quality for the industry as a whole remained quite good, but we did see an uptick in delinquencies in the 30 to 90 day um, short term uh, lending, which we actually flagged as a as a potential indicator of what could be uh, credit problems ahead. So the point you raise, I think, is is one we're very focused on. Thank you. Uh, two things. First. Um, there is a correlation, it's a lagging correlation between when there's an increase in unemployment and then a rise in delinquencies and charge off rates. Um, right now, housing markets are well capitalized. In fact, we have much more equity uh, than we had in the last financial crisis going overall, so I feel confident about that. One other thing that we've been working on on an interagency basis is guidance related to commercial real estate and evaluating that, and certainly it's important that we finish our work there uh, so as to provide financial institutions with greater clarity about what our regulatory expectations are going to be going forward. Uh, similar to Acting Chairman Groomberg, the aggregate 
view on credit uh, to date looks modest. However, there are some signals of deterioration, especially for certain segments. And I think that's where a lot of focus now is on which segments, whether it's within consumer or, or wholesale or commercial real estate. Uh, thank you so much for the reassurances that those are being monitored. You know, uh, I know that um, the employment number is the big number when it comes to balancing out uh, uh, the policy response on uh, inflation and, uh, and interest rates. Uh, but there really is um, a, a very significant possibility that the employment number can remain unaffected while the delinquency rates continue to rise. You don't necessarily need to lose your job to start having hardship and making payments. And, um, and if the um, unemployment rate becomes the, um, the trigger point for delinquencies to increase, that's actually kind of over the line already. And so I'm grateful that we're monitoring the delinquency rates in terms of our regulatory agencies, and I'm grateful that the Federal Reserve is monitoring that as they consider policy response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Norman from South Carolina is now recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank each of you for appearing here. Uh, I'm in the real estate business, been in doing it for 40 years. I will tell you, the banks that you're regulating, uh, your delinqu delinquencies are going up. So goes housing, and I would argue so goes commercial development, uh, affect the economy. And when you have the net disposable income being eroded by inflation that's going to continue, rising interest rates, uh, there are problems on the horizon. I'm from South Carolina. Um, the, the lunacy of what's happening, particularly now with the diesel shortage, uh, the, uh, to correct climate change and to uh, eliminate fossil fuels, the trucks now that deliver um, our concrete, our uh, lumber, uh, they're gonna be sidelined because there's gonna be a diesel shortage. Now I'm trying to find, most companies are trying to find solar panel panels to run our 50 ton trucks and battery operated uh, dump trucks, it's kind of been hard. So the delinquencies will be going up and you better, and this, I know the stress tests say that it's, it's good now, but I would, has been on a bank for a long time, it, it's coming down the pipe. Um, all of you, I think, raised your hand uh, on the issue with MDIs and delinquencies. And I think all of you mentioned, and may, Mr. Greenberg, you may have been the one that mentioned your, in response, you wanna expand access, I assume, to capital. You can, well, I wouldn't want to expand access to capital, but I think in the comment I was making, it was access to the banking system for people who are outside of the system. I think so I assume the access is not there now. So can you give me an example of how you're going to expand access if that's not already there? Well, either, I mean, the good news is that there is general access to the banking system in the United States. We do a survey every two years with the census of who's unbanked and underbanked in the United States. We just released the most recent survey and the, the, the number of unbanked households in the US went down. It's now at 4.5% and it's been declining steadily for over a decade. So that, that is the good news. And that really does make a difference in terms of access to credit and other services um, uh, for those households. We still do have significant disparities uh, for minorities, low-income households, households headed by a person with disabilities. So we do still have challenges in terms of expanding access, but the overall story is we have been making significant progress. You would agree most failure, or a lot, a lot of the calls for failures of banks is when you lend money and either don't get paid back or don't have delays, you have delinquencies. Would you? And that, that's a problem in today's world with what we're, with all we're facing. Mr. Harper, you mentioned on the appraisal, I guess, discrimination. Most banks pick appraisers, they get bids. How are you gonna, what should the appraisers do that they're not doing now to eliminate what you said was, I assume, discrimination in appraisals? So one thing that's being worked on is ensuring that appraisers, as the training program goes forward, that they've got training on fair lending. There is a requirement now that they have unbiased and, uh, and that they're- uh, Is that not happening now? Well, there has been a study, was it FHFA, if I remember correctly, did a study recently where they found some very um, strong language, like the, the, the house is located in an underserved uh, community area, 
and in writing down, uh, there are certain language uh, that really should not be brought to bear and considerations not to bear well, most, when you're trying to consider a, a comparable value. Mr. Tarper, most appraisals get value. You have to come up with a value and you, you get like, like uh, houses with, with similarities to come up with a value that's fair for the banks that you regulate to, uh, to be able to make the loan. So uh, tell me so, what's, what's missing in that? Uh, so um, a great example, New York Times story. Uh, recently uh, covered a black family uh, in Baltimore that uh, went, actually I think it was a, uh, a multiracial family in Baltimore. They went and they got an appraisal on their house because they wanted to do some refinancing and do some other things for home improvement. But I, I had, only got they, 32 they seconds. Laid, Tell they me had, what, what, they, what they, the New York Times say is, that was fair. The initial appraisal came in. Uh -huh. it, it was $300,000 less than market value. They whitewashed their home, took out any uh, segment and, and recognition, and that home appraised for almost $300,000. Okay, can you send me all that information? We'll do. Yeah, print the article and, and the backup information for it. Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to see that. Yes. Um, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on national security, international development, and monetary policy is now recognized for five minutes for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your service to our country. Grateful. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Digital assets and blockchain technology have the potential, in my opinion, to make our financial system faster, cheaper, and more transparent. It is clear, however, that this innovation requires guardrails to protect consumers, just as we've seen over the past week with FTX. In May of this year, the collapse of the algorithmic stablecoin Terra destabilized digital asset markets and produced instability that would lead to the bankruptcy of several large crypto firms. My draft legislation, the Stablecoin Innovation and Protection Act, and the legislation being written by this committee would establish definitions and requirements for stablecoin issuers. Both bills would require stablecoins to be backed one-to-one -one with U.S. dollars or other highly high-quality liquid assets, and each would create a pathway for banks and non-banks entities to become licensed stablecoin issuers. Mr. Barr, if I can start with you, sir. Um, the Federal Reserve has been discussed as a potential regulator for stablecoins issued by bank and non-bank entities. If given oversight of these stablecoin issuers, how would you go about developing a supervisory framework that ensures a level playing field for both bank and non-bank issuers? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I, I do think it's quite critically important that whatever stablecoin legislation is developed has a, a really strong role for Federal Reserve approval and supervision and regulation of stablecoins because stablecoins are, are a form of private money. And, and as I've said earlier, you know, the historical evidence is that private money without appropriate regulation can lead to runs and financial instability. And, and it's also important to have that Federal Reserve oversight and approval and, and regulation authority because stablecoins linked to the dollar are really borrowing the trust of the Federal Reserve, borrowing the trust of the central bank. So I think that's a core principle. Uh, if we have that core principle met, then we can uh, supervise institutions in a way that is treating like risks in a like way, uh, that's making sure that institutions that are offering stable coins have that strong prudential oversight, have strong consumer and investor protections in place so that we don't see the kind of uh, shenanigans that, that we've witnessed uh, in the crypto space in recent times. And, and how do you feel the framework for non-bank issuers uh, could differ from, from bank issuers? I, th I think it's really critically important, again, that if you're engaged in the same risk, uh, you're regulated in the same way. That means really strong prudential oversight, strong uh, rights of approving an application, because once you get a bad apple in the system, it's very hard to get it out. Uh, strong uh, uh, supervision of those firms and, and meaningful capital, liquidity rules, reserving rules, uh, all of that is really critical to get. And, whether the Congress authorizes a bank to do that or a non-bank to do it, we need to make sure that there's strong prudential oversight. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And by the way, congratulations again on your appointment. Thank you. Uh, I believe Congress uh, should, should establish guardrails for stablecoin issuers and that help consumers know that stablecoins they invest in are backed by real assets, to your point, and, and the dollar will be waiting for them when they uh, go to redeem a stablecoin. I think very important. On that note, I'd like to shift to uh, you, Mr. Groomberg, if that's okay. Uh, the necessity of an insurance product for stablecoin issuer deposits is something I've considered while looking into this topic. 
In your opinion, if stablecoin issuers are required to regularly prove that they are fully backed by cash or cash equivalents, does that eliminate the utility of creating an insurance product for stablecoin deposits? Um, Congressman, it's an important question. We'll have to look at it really carefully. You know, stablecoins, depending on what they're backed by, the FDIC insures deposits. If we're talking about a basket of some kind of assets, you're talking about a different kind of thing. So the need for prudential regulation, I think there's a, a case to be made for it. I think deposit insurance is perhaps a separate question. Yeah, I mean, I think my legislation empowers the FDIC to create an insurance fund for stablecoin issuers, and would I'd love to discuss this in, in more depth with you if, if you'd be open to that. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much, and thank you to all our panelists, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Another gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is recognized for five minutes for his questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll begin by saying that we're going to miss you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Barr, as you know, we held a hearing to examine the potential implications of a Federal Reserve-issued central bank digital currency. Do you see any urgent need for a U.S. central bank digital currency at this time? Uh, th thank you for the question. I, I think it's important for the Federal Reserve to study the question very carefully, to do uh, the research that's required, to think about the technical implementation aspects of a central bank digital currency, and, and that's so that if if we in the Congress and the executive branch decide it makes sense to go forward, that we're prepared to do that in a thoughtful and, and careful way. I do like that answer. I'm going to follow up on it. Um, committee Republicans have em emphasized the Federal Reserve does not have the legal authority to issue a central bank digital currency absent action from Congress and strong support from the executive branch. Uh, while the next steps are up to Congress to determine, what would you define as strong support? from the executive branch? Uh, is it in the form of a letter or an executive order? What are your thoughts? Uh, the, the truth is I haven't thought deeply about that, about that question. I, I think it, I, I'd want to make sure that there was a clear indication of support from Congress and the executive branch. And ideally, that would be in the form of authorizing legislation. In particular, from the executive branch, I mean, strong support. Um, what, what is that to you? I, I guess you haven't thought about it that much. but. Um, could you elaborate a little bit? Well, I apologize. I, I don't have a, a, a deeper answer than the one that I gave, which okay. is I, I think, you know, ideally Congress would, would authorize uh, the issuance of CBDC if, if we decided and you decided and the executive decided that it made sense. And in the meanwhile, our focus is really about making sure we understand the technical aspects of what it would look like, doing some pilot experimentation, doing the kind of... Uh, uh, analysis of what potential use cases would be and what the implications of those use cases would be for financial stability, for the payment system, for the banking system. So we're really quite focused on the kind of underlying work rather than the this uh, ultimate question of whether it makes sense to go forward. It sounds like it's a very thorough process and should take a good bit of time. Um, one last question for you. As you are aware, uh, real-time payments networks are becoming more prominent, and the Fed itself is set to debut its FedNow service. Would you describe how these innovations provide similar benefits to a Fed-issued uh, digital currency? Well, I, I really think of these things as in just totally different buckets. I, I think it's really important for us to get the basic payment rails right. I think the innovations in real-time payments have been um, significant. When the Federal Reserve rolls out FedNow this spring and summer, coming spring and summer, I think it'll provide uh, a really important service to community banks that they can then offer to their customers, uh, and that will improve uh, the payment system for everybody. I think the, the question of central bank digital currency is really a, a separate question from that. It might end up being complementary to it. It might have you know, a focus on, on wholesale, which is quite different than what's going on with uh, reforms in, say, FedNow. So I, I, I think of those as swimming in, in their own lane. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's been an honor serving with you. We're going to miss you. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Timmons. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, who's also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes for his comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to all our witnesses. Um, so last week, uh, I was in Egypt at the, the Conference of the Parties, the climate conference that was going on, and I, I share that because I'm getting a little bit, it's a little bit surreal sitting here. 
one of the major themes of that conference was we were getting beat up as Americans by the developing world because they would like to invest in cleaner, cheaper energy, and global capital markets are disfavoring their economies. They're disfavoring them, number one, because of the robustness of U.S. capital markets that's attracting capital, and they're disfavoring them, number two, by their own admission, because they have become so dependent on fossil fuel subsidies that they have no way to rip off the Band-Aid. And so the, the market signals that would attract clean energy aren't there because they've artificially depressed the price of fossil energy. And they weren't beating up on capitalism. They were basically asking us, how do we provide a global capitalism that, that is not untethered from a moral obligation to the least fortunate? And now I'm sitting here today, a week later, where a lot of my colleagues who represent oil and gas intensive districts who are, who, are having, who are struggling to attract capital for those same reasons, who have overly subsidized the fossil industry and don't know how to pull off that Band-Aid, are blaming capitalism for their, saying that somehow this is woke capitalism instead of acknowledging that we have the same moral obligation to their constituents as Americans that we have to the Egyptians, to the Iranians, to the Nigerians. And there's a conversation we could and should be having about our moral obligation to Americans. But to do that, we're gonna need our colleagues across the aisle to have the self-awareness and the economic sophistication of your average developing world economic minister. And I hope that someday we can do that. I am grateful for all of you in your role on FSOC that you have understood the risks of climate change and finance. And to that end, um, uh, Vice Chair Barr, I'd, I'd like to start because in 2020, the CFTC did a report managing climate risk in the financial sector that, among other things, observed that private banks were disproportionately offloading their mortgage risk onto Fannie and Freddie in low-lying coastal areas. When I, when I asked Chair Powell about that last March, I, I asked if he was indeed observing that. He said that's a very likely outcome. And then followed up by asking, leaving aside taxpayer-backed risk that we're offloading this onto, are we, do we have the tools within the Federal Reserve to monitor how capital flows are moving from the big sophisticated banks that can see these risks coming onto the lower, less sophisticated players in the system? Not, not is it moving, but do we have the tools to monitor? And as it, his answer was, quote, I would have to think about that. That was eight months ago. So my question for you is, do you now have the tools to monitor how these sophisticated players are starting to offload climate risk so that we can make sure that we are doing the scenario analysis that you're all trying to do within FSOC? Uh, thank you. It's a, a terrific question. I would say that we're quite at an early stage in our ability to understand the way in which climate change flows through to financial risk and how that financial risk is distributed across the financial system. I, I would describe our efforts as nascent. Uh, and so the work that we're doing uh, now uh, across the agencies to develop a climate guidance uh, for large banks is a, a part of that. And the work we're doing at the Federal Reserve to pilot climate scenario analysis for really just six of the eight you know, GSIBs in the country, that, that is a nascent effort. It's new. And so I would say, uh, in answer to your question, that we're not yet um, uh, confident that we understand the full range of financial risks that uh, might be posed, uh, and that that, uh, and nor do we have a, a complete understanding of the distribution of that risk. I, I want to just go quick because I want to get another question, but I, I am concerned that the risks are moving, that the risks are being offloaded, and we need to protect ourselves from that. The, the second one, I'd like uh, uh, ask unanimous consent to introduce for the record this article: "Gas, Guns, and Government's Financial Cost of ESG Policies." As Folks in the United States are, instead of embracing markets, asking for more subsidies for fossil fuels. We are seeing states in oil and gas intensive areas passing legislation to prevent banks from investing in clean energy. We saw this happen in Texas in this report that I've just um, introduced. It's a Wharton study co-authored by um, uh, Ivan Ivanov, who I believe is one of the economists at the Federal Reserve, makes the observation that that as a result of Texas passing this law that has prevented banks in Texas who want to participate in pension funds from, who are choosing to prioritize climate risk, there's now less competition in those markets and it has cost Texas, rate payer, Texas taxpayers over $530 million. And so, so Mr. Barr, my question for you, and I know I'm getting out of time here, is um, 
Do you agree that ignoring climate risk puts retirees, banks, and the public at risk? And is that, in fact, a breach of their fiduciary duty? Uh, Chairman Water, shall I respond? I, I, I do think that, you know, from, from our perspective, it's important that um, financial institutions be able to uh, serve their customers consistent with safety and soundness, and, and we don't get involved in, in deciding uh, whom they should lend to or who they should not lend to based on, on climate factors. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here. I know you've been here for a while, but we're, we're getting near the end. Um, one of the things that I've learned through uh, studies of uh, exceptionalism and uh, achievement is uh, setting goals that are achieve, achievable. If you, ex if you set your expectations too high, um, then it's actually a disincentive for someone to even begin in, in trying to achieve those. And uh, Chairman Greenberg, at a June 6 forum sponsored by the Urban Institute, you said that we need to raise the bar for performance, meaning what a bank did before to earn an outstanding or high satisfactory will not be sufficient. They will have to engage in more lending activity to earn the recognition. This is regarding CRA. The goal is more lending to more low to moderate income communities. And so, you know, from that statement, it implies that, that uh, banks are not currently doing enough uh, in terms of CRA activity. So my question is, when do you believe the bar needs to be raised uh, for CRA performance? And also 125% threshold for outstanding performance may be nearly impossible uh, for banks with significant market share to achieve, which again may disincentivize them for CRA activity altogether. So my question is, how and why did the FDIC arrive at these thresholds? Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, th that was when it's a notice of proposed rulemaking that you're referring to, and that was a joint notice of proposed, <clears throat> pardon me, rulemaking for the three banking agencies, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC. So that was a joint proposal. I think the objective uh, was to look at the uh, uh, ratings that are used for CRA lending, and we now have an expanded set of metrics to try to evaluate how institutions are performing. And we proposed um, a set of thresholds uh, with the objective of expanding access and seeing if institutions could do more. We put that out for comment. We're receiving, we've received comment on it. We're in the process of developing a final rule, and I do think we're keenly sensitive both to the objective of expanding access and to the capability of institutions, as you suggest, to, to meet the objectives we set. So it's a work in progress. I well, I appreciate you keep us up to date on, on where we are with that because we all want participation in CRA, but if we raise it too high, we don't want to disincentivize banks who could really do a lot from for participating. And when you're talking about the rules, um, the proposed one-year implementation period uh, following publication of a final rule seems to be very short, especially the complexity of, of some of these rules. And I would think that a longer period would be necessary. One year is a very short time for banks to turn operations over to a new regime of requirements and collect and report the data required for benchmarking and comparisons. With these type of constraints, because we're coming out with rules and regulations. We want to make sure, one, they're understood and that banks can comply with them. You know, regulation shouldn't be a gotcha game. It should be there to protect the bank, to protect the consumers, protect everyone who's engaged in it. And um, is, is there any consideration for implementing a longer period of time for compliance? Is that direct? That, that's for you, sir, yes. yes. Um, we certainly received comment on it, um, and that's something that we're going to give careful consideration to in the rulemaking, in the final rulemaking. Okay, and I'm going to do something that uh, is is unusual for somebody in my position. I've still got 53 seconds left, and I'm going to return that. I was, I, 
I, uh, I appreciate that. Thank all right. You very Thank much. you, Madam Chair. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this critical hearing and uh, really appreciate your ensuring that oversight continues to remain a top priority for this committee. Now, clearly, the CFPP is the first federal agency with a single mission of protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. So uh, an agency truly on the side of consumers. And now, after years of Republican sabotage, the Bureau's funding structure is under unwarranted attack yet again. And with this recent court healing, uh, ruling, if that's upheld, this has the potential to really invalidate previous CFPB decisions and to leave consumers vulnerable. In the home lending market specifically, any disruptions can make it even harder for home buyers to qualify for a loan, disproportionately burdening those who have historically uh, really been shut out of home ownership, uh, in particular uh, black uh, and brown uh, communities. Uh, congratulations on your appointment. I can share Bloomberg, as you know, the Bureau's regulations provide a degree of certainty and flexibility for banks. So without them, do you think it is possible that we will see the mortgage market constrict and, and uh, for fewer loans? Congressman, Congresswoman, I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question? Because I had some difficulty following it, if, I, if, I, if you might. Okay. Okay, I want to I want to ask you about the Bureau's regulations. Since they do provide a degree of certainty and sure. flexibility for banks, without these regulations, oh, I see. do you think it's possible that we will see the mortgage market constrict and provide fewer loans? Well, I, th I do think the consumer protections offered by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau are critical to protecting um, uh, consumers in the market in the credit marketplace, and if the functions of the CFPB were are undermined, it it would have consequences. Okay, thank you. And can you elaborate on how invalidation of the bureau's rules could lead to instability in the mortgage market? Well, to the extent uh, CFPB rulemakings provide important consumer protections, and if those protections are removed, that'll have consequences for those borrowers. I mean, that's um, pretty straightforward, I think. Sure, a heightened risk of, uh, of damages, sort of exposure there. Uh, I'm also troubled by the fact that the 45 years since the CRA's passage, that people of color are still more likely to lack a bank account and to get curbed down for credit. Now, while the proposed rule noticed in May is promising, there's still more that can be done to strengthen the CRA and to address this nation's history of redlining, discrimination, and exclusion. Now, that was certainly at the heart of the CRA when it was first crafted, and this should be our guiding principle as we seek to strengthen it. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, because Black, Brown, and AAPI folks have disproportionately been unbanked and denied access to credit, do you think the proposed rule should implicitly include communities of color in the bank's assessment areas? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I think that the proposed reform, uh, the, the rule that the three agencies has put uh, forward, uh, strikes a very good balance on this question. Uh, discriminatory practices uh, that banks may engage in uh, can result in a downgrade of, uh, of CRA activity. And uh, in addition, uh, banks may not, under the rule, uh, uh, improperly exclude uh, communities of color in defining their assessment areas. And the assessment areas themselves are de designed to be drawn broadly uh, so that uh, banks could not exclude areas on an improper basis or, or even on a basis that is a proxy for an improper basis. And I think those, um, those kinds of approaches uh, will appropriately make sure that uh, banks are, are not engaging in, in any activity that would be designed to or in effect exclude uh, people of color. Well, one thing's for sure, it's really critical that we do modernize the CRA. I do believe by focusing on racial disparities and going beyond simply using income as a proxy for race. You know, we have to be race conscious in our approach to root out this discrimination in our banking system. So, uh, again, I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much, and I think we have met our hard stop time. 
And I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. We're coming right down. I'll be right down. Hold it.